<laughs> no one's ever done interviews with their sunglasses on. I have to keep them on to protect myself from the fire, <laughs> which I'm about to bring to the world. Racism's for the poor people. Because if you keep the poor people divided, they can't wake up long enough to do what I did and read about how money works. The future is based on enslavement. It's based on removing your freedoms, telling you you're going to be safe, to keep you believing the lies, and being a good slave until you die. It's almost like I predicted Corona itself. You know, when Noah built the ark, he was a crazy right-wing conspiracy theorist until it started to rain, right? Now he's not crazy anymore. What's the one thing I've said today you disagree with most? The one thing you said today that I disagree with most. All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Andrew Tate here. I don't know where the fuck he came from, but he's here in <laughs> Miami. What's up, man? Hey, man, I'm glad to be here, my friend. I'm really glad to be here. No Listen, one, you can't walk in the studio looking like this. Just got swag off the charts. Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay clean. You know, this is Miami, so I thought I had to, you know, dress up and look my best. Listen, we got new lights and stuff, but you got your sunglasses on. We're just going to roll with it. Let's do it. No one's ever, ever done an interview with their sunglasses on. I can't read your eyes. So that's fine. Whatever. Who I knows? have to keep them on to protect myself from the fire. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm about to bring to the world. You understand? This is eye protection. All right. I think of you as like the Dan Bilzerian of Eastern Europe. Is that a fair characterization? That's a pretty fair characterization, but there's a slight difference in okay. that. And I'm not hating on Dan. Okay. I don't mind Dan as an individual. Okay. But Dan is more of a customer and I'm more of a pimp. <laughs> Do you understand? Dan's, no, I don't. Dan's, the, Dan's the kind of guy who would contact a man like me to get girls in his videos and okay. his pictures. I'm the kind of guy where the girls pay me the money Dan gave them. Why? Because that's just how the game goes. I mean, I, I first made my millions of dollars. The first time I ever became a millionaire was with Webcam Studio. Oh, really? I didn't know that. that. Yeah, this is how I first ever made money. I mean, I was a kickboxing world champion, but kickboxing is not boxing, right? Yeah. So I'd make like $100,000 a fight. You fight two or three times a year. You pay 20% to your manager. You pay taxes, but you're not rich, rich. But um, when I retired from fighting, it was because I found this little hustle of getting very beautiful girls to sit on laptops and talk to these men on the internet. And I grew this little empire. And I, that's how I first started making millions of dollars. So that's how I first got rich. Where, where is this all happening? What country? This was all happening in England. Okay, yeah. so my life story is eclectic, bro. It's going to be hard to like Listen, keep track. You're going to be like, what, I, I what, have, what? I, I, I'm prepared to sit here for as long as this takes okay. because I know this is going to be uh, entertaining to okay. say the least. I'll do my best. You grew up in the United States. Correct. Where? I grew up in a party town called Goshen, Indiana. It's, All right. it's, yeah, no one's heard of it. It's not a party town. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I grew up in Goshen, Indiana. Um, my father was a chess grandmaster. I was on track to become a chess grandmaster. So well, I was, he, he was a legitimate chess grandmaster. My father was the highest rated black chess player in history. Really? Yeah. So wow. My father was a big G in chess. Yeah. So I kind of grew up around all these chess geniuses, which is a really unusual way to grow up because you have like XKGB guys, you have complete autists, mm -hmm. like everyone's a weirdo, right? You're not well, that, you're not that good at chess and be normal. What happened to you? <laughs> yeah. I'm weird too, I guess. I don't know, but it was kind of weird, like growing up around all this hyper intelligence mm -hmm. and, uh, like even my father, a lot of people say, oh, I, I know this guy, he's really smart, or I know this guy has a photographic memory. No, and I'm not just saying this because he's my dad. When you've met true supreme intelligence, I've never met anybody else in the world who had the level of intelligence he had. So like when you're like a grandmaster at chess, like Fisher chess, which my understanding is that they just scramble up all the pieces and you just look at the board. Yeah. He could pretty much beat anyone in the world. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's more than even that. It's more just like supreme the ability to supremely recall information. When I was with my father, if he needed your phone number, he'd ask, what's your phone number? And you'd say it once, and that was it for the rest of his life. He didn't have to write it down. You tell him an address, that was it for the rest of his life. He never wrote anything down. He never had to repeat anything to him. My father, when he died, someone messaged me who was in, because my father was in the CIA. He held the, fa the, record of the, CIA, the CIA record for the fastest assimilation of a foreign language. My father learned Russian within two and a half weeks from zero. Like, really? he'd, yeah, he'd just read a book. He'd just read the dictionary. Like to these people, it's just like, just, just read it. When my dad died, James Altucher, do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. my James Altucher, you can ask him about my dad. Him and James played a game and it was a draw in the end. And James did a tribute to my father saying that he was just a scary dude. Like he was just supremely smart, right? So, so I, when, when you were growing up, did you know your dad was in CIA? Uh, he had left the military by the time I was any, I was like three when he left. Got it. To, okay. to, to pursue chess. Um, so yeah, he was a linguist. He knew like four languages and he was a professional chess player. And I grew up around this absolute supreme intelligence. And I always knew, even when I was a child, that I was smart, but I wasn't that smart. Mm -hmm. Like I, my, my, my beautiful mother watered me down. Like <laughs> I didn't have what he had. Like he was complete. He remembered every chess game he'd ever played. 
So you could be sitting there and he'd, he'd say, oh, I played him in 1982. And he'll just go through the whole game. Or he could beat you at chess without looking at the board. So you'd have a board in front of you and say E4. He'd be in another room. C5, knight F3, knight C6. And he'd be cooking dinner and he'd fucking smoke you. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. He'd play simultaneouses where he played like 100 people in a row. So they'd sit there and they'd think and he'd just go board to board, just make quick moves. He played a, a blind simultaneous where I'm just talking about different... Uh, you have a board and he has nothing. He played three people at once blind, beat them all. That's, that's how good grandmasters are. This is what people don't understand about chess. Chess, I'm a kickboxing world champion and I'm telling you, forget the UFC, forget kickboxing. The hardest sport in the world is world level chess. These guys are wired different. You can't learn it. You either have it or you don't. So how do you go from your dad being so intelligent, so successful at chess to wanting to kickbox? Because to me, they're the same thing. Okay, why? Because I, I was growing up with chess and then my mother and father split up. My mom was English, wanted to go back to England. I was 11, 10 or 11. We went back and in America, chess is quite big in the schools. And obviously I had my father as a coach who would take me to tournaments, all these things. I lost my- So, so you played a lot as a kid. I was state chess champion age five in Indiana, the under 16s. I was the youngest ever win it. <laughs> I remember, I remember I was sitting there. I was sitting there across, I was sitting there across from some 16 year old. When you're like five and a half, that's scary, right? And I remember when I beat him, he cried. That made me happy. <laughs> I was like, ha ha. Not at so big five, now. Wait, at five years old, yeah. you were the Indiana State chess, chess champion. champion. And the under 16s, yeah. So I was the youngest ever win it. So I was, on, I, was way on the, I was on the way to becoming a grandmaster. Did you watch uh, Queen's Gambit? I'm assuming everyone's asked you about this. I haven't watched it because I believe it's feminist Hollywood garbage and it's propagating the demise of masculinity amongst the population. So sorry to give you a Alex Jones answer, but why? the answer is no, because it's, because it's, it's just feminist garbage and it ain't true. What, why do you believe that? I believe that because that's what's obviously happening. I mean, there are, there are talented female players, but they're not nearly as talented as the men overall. They're not nearly as good as the men overall. I think the best female in the world is like number 50 in the world. If you, if you incorporate men, and I believe that Hollywood takes every single chance it can to empower females to the point of reducing men's ability to look like a man, right? They just want to, it's feminist propaganda. That's all it is. This woman comes along, she's beautiful. Everyone doesn't take her seriously. She beats them all at chess. Every dude in every movie is getting beaten up by a chick. That's not real. Whenever you watch something on TV in every sitcom, the mom's the smart one, the dad's the bumbling idiot. Like, I just feel like men are kind of on, under attack in culture. So I'm not going to sit there and watch a chess movie, which I know is absolute fantasy, which is just propagating females beating men at something else. They, they don't beat men at. You, they don't win. What, what's the best female chess player of all time? I don't know. Okay. Do you have any clue that have they ever been top 10, top five? No, Has anyone ever it's, it's going to be all? like, I, I think maybe top 20, maybe top 30 at most, never top 10. Okay. And so how big is the difference between top 10 and top 20 or top 30? It's pretty big. And uh, although in like, like uh, if, a num if number five sits down with number 25, is it just 99 out of a hundred times number five wins or more, more like 70, 75%, I think. Okay. Yeah. Because what happens in, in chess is especially if, you're really good. Even if you're in a losing position, you can push for a draw, right? So it's very hard to beat someone better than you. You might get a draw out of them, but to actually beat them, actually to crush them is difficult. And this is what my dad was so known for. My dad is famous in the chess community to this day. Emery Tate was his name. They called him E.T. as in the alien. Because my dad was one of the only players who would never take a draw. And he would rather lose in a blistering blitzkrieg fashion than take a draw, right? So he had some big losses, but he also had some fantastic crushing victories where he just went all out. He was, he was really on the board. It was like, it was Blitzkrieg. He'd just yep. come at you with everything. And everyone to this day, even when he died, James Altucher was talking about him saying, I never played a guy who played chess like that. The guy was just crazy. Yeah. So it, he, was a, he was a crazy chess so player. So why do you say chess and kickboxing are so similar? Because I want him, firstly, I want to make someone else cry. Mm -hmm. Like the 16 year old I made cry. Secondly, in most sports, there's a degree of luck. I, I'm tired of listening to poker. Every time I mention chess, some guy mentions poker. I don't play chess, I play poker, as if it's the same intelligence level. Shut up. One, it's not, right? Poker, yeah, you have to be semi-smart, but you don't need to be a, a, an actual genius to play poker. That's the first be, thing. Because of the luck involved? There's luck. I don't, I don't care how good you are. If I get pocket aces every single hand and you get a crap hand every single hand, no matter how good you are, I'm likely to win overall, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas there's luck involved. So there's, and in most- you, you know that luck's not real, right? You think, is luck not real? Yeah. This you want to hear my theory on this? Tell me. So luck is purely a psychological concept. So all these people who are like, oh, I got lucky. No, you didn't. It's probability. So probability is a mathematical concept, okay. right? Meaning that uh, the hand that you get dealt, that's not luck or not luck. It's just probability. So yeah. 
you had lower high probability of getting that hand. Uh, same thing with outcomes in life, yep. right? It's all probability based. Yep. Luck is a psychological concept, meaning that let's say you and I both go to war, yep. right? And uh, your leg gets blown off. Yep. And I say to you, man, you know what? You were really unlucky that you're the one who was sitting in that seat in that vehicle that got blown up. And you may say back to me, no, I'm lucky because yep. I'm, I got my other two arms and legs. Yep. And so luck, even though we both see the same situation, it's all the mentality. That's what determines luck. I, not I completely agree with you, but don't you think that viewing yourself as a lucky individual will give you an advantage as viewing yourself as an unlucky individual, even though it's all probability based. If you go through life, there's and say, academic research that suggests literally the best way to become quote unquote more lucky is to literally just start saying I'm a lucky person. <laughs> well, there you go. Then. But it's, so, all, it's all psychological. Yeah. Yeah. It's all psychological. The concept of probability versus the concept of luck gets completely conflated in society yep. and it's, it's safe, right? Everyone's like, Oh, I got lucky. I got lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, why are you successful? You ever heard a successful person? No one wants to say, Hey, there's a probabilistic, uh, environment that got put into or a probabilistic. Some of us know, are going to get rich. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I made decisions that helped me get there. Yeah. Everyone just says, Oh, I got lucky. Yeah. yeah like yeah. no, you didn't. It's a psychological concept because yeah. that same person who did this exact same steps in life yeah. would walk away and say, I didn't get lucky. I'm unlucky because X, Y, Z reason. This is true. I complete. I actually completely agree with you. But it's, I, it's, it's one of the things that I believe and can prove from a psychological yeah. and mathematical standpoint yeah. that the most number of people get very uncomfortable when I talk about it. No, but I agree with you completely. But I, I actually agree with you. I've always viewed myself as exceptionally lucky because I just think that's the best way to approach situations. Yeah, it, it completely changes uh, the psychological way that you view the world yeah. and what you can do. It's just like saying I'm a happy person. Yep. Yeah then all of a sudden things that happen to you that would take you out of that state of happiness yep. are much less likely to actually have an effect because you just view yourself as being a happy person. I completely agree. In fact, I said something like this. Someone was talking about feeling sad or whatever, and, and we're talking about when am I ever sad because I'm always so positive. And I said, no, I'm different variations of happy. I have more happy and I have slightly less happy. But unless something terrible has happened, I've lost a family member, or unless I'm literally distraught, every day is a happy day. Yep. Even sad days are a happy day. They're less happy than yesterday, but it's still a happy day. Overall, I'm a happy, lucky person, and I refuse to be to categorize myself as anything else. So I, I agree with you. All right. So kickboxing, kickboxing. you end up becoming a four-time world champion? Four-time world champion. Yeah. Okay. So like, that's not like, hey, let me go out in the backyard and like kick somebody in the head and hope like I'm good at it, right? No, no it was, but I took chess very seriously. Chess was six hours a day of my life, and I wanted another sport. I won't say luck again because we've had that conversation, but I want another sport where a teammate couldn't save me or that there was no probable chance that my opponent would have an unfair advantage yep. like poker. So uh, chess is one-on-one. -on -one, and if you lose somewhere along the line, you made a mistake. And f fighting is exactly the same. And both of them are brutal. And in both of them, you're trying to crush your enemy as ruthlessly as possible. And I always thought I saw the mental similarity between the two. So I decided to start learning to fight. I started when I was around 16 and I became world champion at 23, but it's all I did. 16. All right. So you start at 16. Yeah. And when you decide to do this, uh, I know very little about kickboxing, yep. but my guess is that that's not something that you're just like naturally good at. Right. I think you can have, you do. There's certainly some talent level. You can be naturally good at it. Fighting very much like chess is also a thinking man sport. Mm -hmm. I've had 87 fights. My nose has never been broken. Right. Mm -hmm. You, you see the fighters that look like fighters. They're not as good as the fighters that don't look like fighters. Those are the ones you got to worry about, yep. right? So it's certainly a thinking man sport. It's certainly tactics. It's certainly, fighting's very simple. Fighting's like tag. If you were to play tag in slow motion, it's extremely simple. It's easy, but it's hard because things are happening quickly, mm -hmm. right? That's all fighting is. It's not complicated movements. They move their hand. You can see a gap. You hit them or you slide or you move to the side. It's just everything happens so fast. That's all it is. So, But the only difference with kickboxing is it's not just uh, your hands, yeah. right, and kind of punching. There's this whole element of like hip mobility and flexibility and yeah. the ability to kick, yeah. right, and not only to kick somebody in the shin, but to be able to kick them in the head. Yeah, kick right? them in the head. Yeah. Right? Like there's a uh, there's an added level of complexity when you go from boxing to something that looks more like a UFC or a kickboxing. Yeah, in thing. some ways, yes, there's an added level of complexity, but also in other ways, there's an added level of simplicity. Because okay, in, why? It, because in boxing, you have less weapons. So you, you have less to worry about, but you have less to hurt him with. Mm -hmm. Whereas in kickboxing, you have more weapons. You have more to worry about, but you have more to hurt him with. So mm -hmm. in some ways, like in boxing, it's harder to find a way to hurt him even though you have less to worry about. Whereas in kickboxing or UFC, there's always a way to hurt him, right? So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say one's necessarily harder than the other. I just chose kickboxing because it was the only gym I could run to. And my father, my mother and father split up and I loved my father with all my heart, but chess doesn't pay that much. And he loved booze and gambling and women. So he was broke. 
Uh, when we were in England uh, with my mother, the, the British social system gives you a, like a government housing. So we were on welfare effectively. So she had no car. And I was working, I was going to school and I was also working in a fish market and I would carry boxes of ice, like 30 mm -hmm. kilo boxes of ice from 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. every day for no money. So I needed a gym where I could run to. I, I couldn't, there's no other way for me to get there. It was before Uber, I couldn't afford taxis. So the nearest gym I could run to was a kickboxing gym and not a boxing gym. And that's kind of how I ended up kickboxing. My, my coach was a Bosnian special forces guy and he was there and that's it. So when you walk in at 16, do you want to like go compete competitively? Do you just want to like learn how to fight? W what's the thought process? I was just perpetually bored. I think I really don't understand people who say they lack motivation in life because I'll make this extremely clear. If you're not pushing and striving for something, life is so mundane. I've always had this problem with literal crippling perpetual boredom. I was bored. I had no money. I'm, I'm carrying boxes of ice. I'm a smart guy. I'm not playing chess anymore, right? This is, I'm 34 now. So this is quite a few years ago. It's before the internet, before Facebook was all big and nothing. What do you do with your life? What's there to do? I thought the only, I need to do something which drains me so that I can go to sleep at night without frustration. And if I kickbox, if I run three miles to the gym and then fight for three hours and run three miles home, at least I can sleep. Mm -hmm. I, I literally couldn't sleep. I, I, I wouldn't say it's ADHD, but I was just frustrated. And then on top of that, I've always had this huge frustration in regards to money, even though I was poor. I'd grow up around a bunch of other poor kids and we'd be walking to school or walking to college and a Ferrari would drive past and they'd go, oh, cool, Ferrari. And I'd say, doesn't that annoy you? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'd be like, he knows he's hacked the matrix. Don't you see? How does he have 400 grand for a car? He knows something we don't know. Well, aren't you annoyed that there's people out there living a lifestyle that we can't ever aspire to? We're never going to work in a job and pull this off. Doesn't this bother you? And they all be like, no. But me, it was, I was always angry. I was always angry, not angry in a go to jail way, but just in a, I was angry. I was like, something isn't right. Something doesn't add up. So I, kickboxing was my answer. I just started kicking, kicking people's ass and I felt a little bit better. That was kind of how it worked. At what point did you realize you were like world-class at this? So when I, my first day in the gym, I walk in my coach, it was four Bosnian men, men. I was a child. It was four Bosnian men in this tiny little terrible gym. It was not like a commercial gym or a commercial <laughs> class. And he said, can you fight? And I said, yeah, I've done karate for a few years that I got knocked clean out my first day, of course. And I guess they expected me to never come back, but I kept coming back. And my coach said to me, look, after about a year, he said, look, I want to put you into a fight. And he took me down to a town called South End on Sea. And my first fight wasn't kickboxing. My first fight was actually MMA. And it must have been a little over a year because I was 18. And I was fighting a 24-year-old security doorman. And uh, being a stupid American, I thought pounds and kilos were the same because I weighed in at like 82 pounds. He weighed in at like 90. No, I weighed in at 82 kilo. He weighed in at 90 kilo, which is an eight kilo difference, which is almost like... 20 pounds. And I was like to my coach, is that a big difference? He's like, no, no, don't worry about it. I was like, okay. But gotten, thinking back, a 20 pound difference, a big difference in fighting, right? And I got in there and I won. I, I didn't win necessarily through skill, but I just kept going and I just outgassed him. And towards the end, I'm just on top of him, just punch him in the face, right? And I'm only 18 years old. So from there, my coach was like, okay, you have some potential. And, and it, for a long time, it was, I believed it was my only way out because like, like once again, before the internet and stuff, I'm going to college, I finished college. I don't believe in university because I'm too smart to get in debt for formal education. I'm too smart for that junk. So I finished college. I'm working these sales jobs. I was always a good salesman. So I'm working sales jobs. I'm bringing in, you know, 3,000, 4,000 a month, whatever. But I, I thought my only way to get rich, rich is fighting. I couldn't think of another way to get rich. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fight only to get rich, but I saw light at the end of the tunnel. So that's all I wanted to do is just fight, fight, fight. And so at what point do you go fight for the first world championship? So I fight for my first ever world championship on two days notice. So I'm in Slovakia. There was a town. I'm going to tell everyone now on this podcast, I'm going to give the secret away. If you go, if you're bored right now, if you're watching this on the internet, load up Google Maps, right? And there's a town called Kosice, K-O-S-I-C-E. And it's on the opposite end of Slovakia to Bratislava. So Bratislava is the capital. And then you have Kosice on the other side. It's four and a half hours drive from Bratislava. It's about four hours drive from Warsaw and about four hours drive from Budapest. It's in the middle of nowhere. But all the villages and all the towns, everyone around this little town, every hot girl within about 400 square kilometers lived in this town because there's no, there was nowhere else to go, right? And they were all there. And when I was going there, this is pre-EU, they didn't have the Euro. And me and Tristan used to go there on holiday because we would clean up. And when I say clean Tristan's up, your brother. my brother. And when I say clean up, I don't mean clean up like you clean up on holiday with some in Mexico. I mean, clean up with tens, like supermodels. It was unbelievable. And a beer is like 30 cents. 
And we're the only men there who speaks English. It was so much fun. So we used to go to this little town. I'm saying it now because it's completely ruined because they built an airport and then the European Union came along and they, all the hot girls have left. They all live in Switzerland now and they're all in Dubai and it's all ruined. This is all before Instagram and all that crap, right? Instagram's ruined the world because back then a hot girl would be hot and she'd be stuck in her town. Now she's hot and she's in Dubai, right? So this, the game's different, right? But um, so I was in Kashitse and then I got a phone call from Amir saying you have a world title fight in two days. I was literally drunk at the time. And Who's was, Amir? Amir is my coach, sorry. Okay. Uh, he's a Bosnian Muslim. He fought in the Yugoslav conflict. He got shot six times, didn't die. That's Amir, right? So he's still like a father to me today. And uh, I must have been crazy. I was like, okay. I, 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 I can't explain. And I want to say this in, in a way where it's truly understood. When I say I didn't give a shit if I lived or died, I don't mean that in a sad suicidal way. I mean that in an empowered charging at the gunfire way. Back then, I didn't think I had anything that really made me really give a shit about living. Mm -hmm. not, not, in a, not in a do to do sad way, just in a, let's go out in a, in a blaze of glory then. I'm, I'm not rich. I don't have nothing. I'm just banging girls in Slovakia. Well, who is this guy? So it was against the French world champion. Jean-Luc Benoit was his name. And the opponent pulled out and they needed a guy on two days notice. And I had to lose six kilos, which is around 13 or 14 pounds in two days. So is that easy or hard? That's hard, bro. 13 pounds in two days, a lot of weight to lose. So I just started, stopped eating, stopped drinking, sitting in saunas, spitting all, all the water, just dying. Finally made weight, went to France, fought him 12 rounds, my first ever 12 round fight as well, fought him. And uh, they gave the decision to him, but I was robbed. I beat him. And we, <laughs> I beat him. I beat him. I didn't knock him out, but I beat him. And, uh, is this one of the four world championships or this is the a fifth? No, they, no, no. Yeah. Well, it should be. Yeah. But the tape was so convincing. We, the tape was actually sent off the ISKA, the fighting organization, and they command, they demanded a rematch. That's so they knew I won. Right. Okay. But he's France. It was, it, he's French. It was in France and, and fighting has a lot of politics to it. You have to understand. I mean, UFC is UFC, the real big ones, but outside of the smaller ones, it makes more sense for the French promotion of a French champion. They'll sell a lot more tickets and a lot more mm -hmm. pay-per-views with a French champion. So basically either you knock him out or it's going to go to It's kind of like that, right? Um, so they commanded a rematch and I rematched him seven months later and knocked him out in the eighth and I became world champion. Okay. Why keep going once you've won? There's always a new mountain to climb. I mean, that's kind of, that's a good question because that's also kind of the reason I quit because it was like, why keep going? Well, there's always someone new to fight. And I'm still not financially where I want to be. And I don't know what else I want to do with my life. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep going, right? So I fought again. I beat another Frenchman. And then I fought again. I beat uh, two Dutch guys uh, to become four-time world champion. But one day I woke up and I was like, is becoming five-time world champion going to improve my life? I mean, I've already got, do I need five belts? How, how much money do they pay for these fights? Okay, so first things first, fighting is the worst career path in history. Why? It, it's the worst career path in history. Because it, it, it involves a degree of probability, much like modeling or being a musician, right? You can be a fantastic musician. You can be better than every known musician in the world. But if you don't know the right people, or right place, right time, come up with the right tune, you're just not going to be famous. Same with models. You have the models we all know. There's a whole bunch of women prettier than them who are just doing the little low-level model circuit, not making any money. There's a degree of probability involved with it. That's the first thing. The second thing is it is show business. It's not all about how good you are. It's how good of a show you can sell. Mm -hmm. So if you're really, really good, but nobody's interested in watching you fight, you don't get fights. Yep. Why would someone put, let's say I was amazing and I beat, I beat everyone's ass, but no one pays to watch me. Who would give me a fight against their cash cow? I'm going to smoke him. And no one wants to see me fight. Yeah, like, so basically, if you're like a super technical fighter that has no flair, no personality, no, pers no that's anything, right. it's not very entertaining to watch, but you're good, yeah. it doesn't really sell tickets. It doesn't really sell tickets, and, and everyone's in it for money, right? You can, you can be so boring and so good that you make it to the top. Do you know who Triple G is? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Triple G did it that way, but he's like from Kazakhstan. He barely talks. He's had 400 fights, and now he's known at 38. Like he beats every, he beats so much ass. They had to eventually say, you know what? Okay, we'll put him in there. But you could do a Conor McGregor, have a few fights with a big mouth and do better, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another element of it. There's a huge element of, Who, of show who's business. Be, who's better set up for their career to be Triple G or be Conor McGregor? Conor McGregor is more famous. It's show business. We live in an attention economy. 
The economy we live in now is based on attention. If you can get attention in your direction for any reason, bad or good, you will be successful. The Kardashians have no reason to be successful. It's attention. It's the world we live in now. And there's so much information and so much entertainment around garnering people's attention, stealing people's attention is difficult to do. But if you can find a way to do that, you're going to do well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Triple G has money now, whatever. But I'm saying, what's the odds of doing a Triple G having 400 fights and never losing? Like, like no one can do that but him. He's, he's literally a one in a, a billion. Mm -hmm. So, um... It's a really bad career path for that. And also there's a huge luck element. You have one bad fight, one bad night, one bad injury. That's it. And for it's the over. Yeah. And for the first few years of your fighting, you're getting paid a thousand bucks, three thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. It's not even you're, you need to work on the side. You're giving up all your free time to get punched in the face. Like it's a terrible decision. Like, I don't know why I decided to do it. But eventually, once I was world champion, I'd, I'd get like a hundred grand a fight, but I'd give 20% to my manager, then the UK with the UK taxes. 40, 50% would disappear. And sometimes you only fight twice a year or whatever. I was certainly not rich. I didn't consider so myself rich. you get like rich. 30 to 40% of the money. Yeah. And, and I didn't consider myself rich. Like 30, 40 grand chunks what, twice a year, maybe three times a year. Living in London, London rents, need a car. Mm -hmm. You're trying, you know, like you're not rich in any way. And that's actually the reason I retired because I woke up one day and I thought, I'm giving six hours a day of absolute focus and energy to this. And I believe I'm smart enough that if I put that much tenacity into something else, I can be a multimillionaire. I truly believed that. I was like, I've realized now I've reached a pinnacle of kickboxing. My choice is either to change over to MMA, which I was offered to do earlier in my career. But at the time, the kickboxing contract paid more money. I had to pay the bills. So I went kickboxing. Change over to MMA, learn to wrestle, change over to UFC, blah, blah, blah. But this is also like seven, eight years ago where even the UFC didn't pay the money it pays now. Mm-hmm. But oh, the UFC still doesn't pay that much money from what I understand. No, if you're like top five or champion, yeah. But most of the dudes you're going to see there in the prelims, they're getting 10 grand to fight, nine grand to fight. It's, not, it's nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So it'd be like starting my career all over again. And at the age of 28, I thought, I don't have the gumption to start again. I, mm -hmm. I, I've done, I've been through hell for this. I've broken my hand eight times. My ribs have been broken. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this all over again. So, so what do you do when you realize that, hey, maybe I don't want to keep fighting? I, real, I decide to get rich, rich. What, what does that mean to you? When, when you sit, when you're sitting there, you're getting, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars kind of net on a per fight basis is rich to you. Like, Hey, I want a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million bucks, $20 million, a billion dollars. I want, I want 30 or 40,000 every month, 30 or 40,000 every month. So about half a million bucks a year, give yeah. or take. Okay. I thought, if I had that much money, I could do whatever I wanted. Okay. That's what I decided. So I what's step to do. one that you do? So step one is maybe that's how we ended up here together. My friend, step one is I tried, decided to be very logical about it. Chess player, right? So it's like, I want money. What is money? <laughs> How do banks work? How does credit work? What's fractional reserve banking? All these things we now know to be the biggest cons of the century, right? So I'm sitting there researching money for days and days and days. And then I get more mad because I'm like, whoa, whoa, money's trash and I don't have any. Now I'm really, now I'm really annoyed, right? I thought, I thought like everyone else did that, you know, everyone puts their money in the bank and the money, the bank takes some of other people's money and lends mm -hmm. it out. I didn't know they invented it from the sky. I still, I still at that point thought money was linked to gold. I didn't know nothing. So I'm learning all this stuff and I'm getting really angry. I'm like, now this is really annoying me. So um, anyway, I, I got, I had a piece of paper there and I'm in my research phase and it started to start writing down some dude on YouTube. I don't know who he was, some dork. He was a pro gold guy. This is before I made Bitcoin was probably around then, but like early. He was a pro gold guy saying buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. And uh, he was saying the difference between an asset, a liability, et cetera, et cetera. So I started trying to write down what I had. I was like, I have an apartment. I have a BMW. I can, I, I'm in good shape, but I already use that for fighting. Uh, you know, what can I do? I can play chess. I'm just writing down the things I have and what I'm good at. And then I kind of realized, I was like, I've got like eight girlfriends. <laughs> but because because I was traveling the world and if you win you get a ring girl it's kind of like just she, she's banging the winner right you win a world title you get to choose the ring girl you want it's pretty easy right so I had a girlfriend in Slovakia I had a girlfriend in France I had a girlfriend in England girlfriend all these girlfriends do they know about each other no okay but they find out pretty soon so um I had all these girlfriends so I'm like maybe I could open a strip club and like be a pimp and, you know be a gangster about it da, da, da. and then that opening strip club. That, that's literally the first thing you thought about was well, opening well, a strip club. Well, I thought I have these beautiful girls. How can I, this is before like Twitch existed. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what can I do with these hot girls? I was like, it's just an asset, right? There's these girls and a lot of them were messaging me. They thought I was this millionaire world champion. They all wanted to come London, live with me and thought I was a big boy millionaire and all this stuff. 
So it's like they, they do because wanna, of social media. But, well, partially because of that, and also because they met me. I turn up, I fight, I win, I win the world title, I leave. We're texting each other. They don't. They assume I'm this big yep. boy, right? So I'm kind of like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I thought, man, I, I investigated strip clubs way too much money, but this these, this asset class of beautiful women was kind of on my mind for a few days, and then by absolute coincidence, I stumbled upon somewhere on the internet. I was on some one of those websites where you used to download like free games and bullshit from. And in the corner somewhere, it said, hot girls want to talk to you now or something. I said, hot girls. So I clicked on that, not because I was interested, but because I thought I have hot girls. And it was one of those webcam websites. And I was like, ah, so these girls sit here and talk to dudes for money. So I'm going to get my girls to see. And they're uh, naked. They're just talking. Uh, How does it work? It's 50-50. I mean, it depends on the girl, depends what she wants to do. But the, the, the majority of the job is not based around being naked. The majority of the job is based around being entertaining and being uh, easy to talk to. And the guys who are talking to you need to find you uh, that you need to remember their name, remember their dog's name. You have to be smart. You can't just be a girl and be a bimbo and be naked and make money. You have to be really smart, charming, interesting, happy all the time, positive. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going to try this. So I messaged all five of my girlfriends, told them I had a job for them, explained them what I was going to do. I was going to launch this company. Four of them agreed. All four flew in, sat them around the same table. They were all like, who's she, who's she, who's she? I'm like, well, you're all my girlfriends. Two more left. And, and then uh, two stayed. And that was the beginning of my little uh, attempt at a webcam empire. And I, I put the girls there. And, and my role in it all was I did all the tech side of stuff, which is the first thing, of course. And then also, and I get called a pimp a lot. But I, and the reason I use the term is because I don't see it as a negative term. I see it as positively inspirational and motivating person. I was, I'd motivate the girls. I'd make sure they did their job properly. If they had a bad day online, I'd come up with a good excuse for them. Oh, it's been a football game. It's been really busy. Don't worry. You're so beautiful. Don't be upset. You did better than her. She, she you did the best today. Did a, I keep everything organized, put the schedules together, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, is it hard? It's hard because women have to want to work for you. Okay. Women have to want to obey you. That's okay. what's hard. And you don't do that. This is one of the biggest misconceptions. I really want to cl clear this up. People in the movies and stuff, pimps are like aggressive, mean men. Complete opposite. Pimps are more like James Bond. James Bond's a pimp. He sleeps with a girl to get information. He doesn't care about her. He is absolutely not really a pimp. He doesn't hit her. He makes her love him. She does what he wants. He uses sex as a weapon to reward her. And then he disappears. That James Bond is absolutely not really a pimp. So I say pimp because everyone calls me a pimp online, tries to go, ha ha, you're a pimp, like I'm going to get offended. It's like, no, beautiful women wanted to work for me and they wanted to work for me because I displayed supreme, supreme competence and they knew if they worked for me, they'd make a lot of money. So whenever I was out, I'd, I'd meet a waitress and say, well, you're, look, you're working 10 hours a day for pennies. You can work 10 hours a day for me, make 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month. And over time, I just build up this big, this big little em empire of webcam girls. At one, one point, I had four locations, 75 girls working for me. And I was and, doing- And we say locations like- Explain what goes into a location. I just rent houses. All right. So you rent a house and in the house, you just literally, hey, go live here. There's like technology set up. Yeah. And then you can basically uh, just sit in front of the computer and literally be on the other end of one of these webcams. Yeah. And guys are paying by the minute, by the hour or whatever yeah. Yeah. to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, it's their choice whether they are doing it fully clothed, just talking, yep. getting naked, whatever, yep. and then you're taking some cut of it. Yeah, basically. So I had girls who would live in the house. and That was pretty impressive. I just broke down the webcam you business. Bet. You done it, man. You nailed it. No you background it. information. Yeah, yeah you right. nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. So they'd either, the girls who lived in the house would have a set amount of hours they want to do, and then we'd have rooms that they could book in and, and do X amount of hours. A girl could come and do one a week or whatever. We'd have rooms they could share. And then, um, yeah, very much exactly like you said. They'd, they'd go online. They'd do their hours. They'd have their regular customers. They'd get their money. And then I'd take around half of the money, around 50%. You take 50%. Around 50%. Okay. Is that high or low compared to the rest of the Well, industry? I'll tell you why it's very low. It's low because every time a girl would quit and try and do it by herself, she'd make a fraction of the money overall because she hasn't got the instruction. She hasn't got the motivation. She's just lazy with it, right? And women have a very different mentality to money than men. If you show a woman how to make $1,000 in an hour, she'll think, I only have to, I only have to work an hour a week. Whereas if you show a man how to make $1,000 an hour, he thinks, ah, I can make $18,000 a day. That's the difference between us. So if I had a girl working for me making $20,000, she got ten, dollars I got ten. dollars If she quit, she'd make three for herself, if that. So they made nothing by themselves. They didn't have the instruction, what the about, motivation. Are there other people like you doing this at the time? At the time, I didn't know anybody else doing it like me. Okay. I've now discovered in certain countries, like in Romania and the places I live now, there's a lot of boys doing this. this okay. Is, this is big business. In Colombia, Brazil, this is big. And all the big models on OnlyFans and webcam, nearly all of them work for men. 
Nearly every single, I would say now, if you see a model and she's really big, she's working for a man. Okay, th this is fascinating because uh, take OnlyFans. Yep. We know it's a massive business, right? Yep. It's as much of a technology business as any other business that Absolutely. people want to talk about. Uh, I think people get very uncomfortable talking about some of it just because there's this element of like uh, sex and exploitation yep. and, and whatever. Um, where's the line, right? And, and I ask you because I think that you've seen kind of different variations of this. Yep. You know a lot of the players, et yep. cetera. Is it, this is just a business and people can do what they want to do both as the customer side and yep. the other, and it's like a marketplace. Is it, no, there's like ethical concerns. Like how do you view? I have, I have absolutely zero ethical concerns. I totally, okay. I totally view it free market capitalism. And the reason is this, if I were to shut down my, all my webcam operation, I still have a little bit today. I still have four girls working for me. If I were to shut it all down, it's kind of like if an alcoholic walks into your liquor store and you deny him vodka, does he stop being an alcoholic or does he buy it somewhere else? Like you can't stop. These guys want to spend money. And on top of it, it's actually quite a positive industry. I'm telling you now, and I'll say this here, webcam girls have prevented more male suicide than any, th than, than any therapist, any group of therapies, anything you can possibly think of. There are dudes out there who the only pleasure they have in their world is knowing that this beautiful 19 year old in Ukraine knows their name and remembered their birthday. That is their pleasure on the planet. And really, I'm telling you now, it's far closer to therapy than it is to sex, this webcam industry. These dudes genuinely enjoy looking after the girl. The girl genuinely becomes friends with the dudes. And overall, it's, it's a very positive thing. I've had girls work for me who had one boyfriend their entire life, and they're, they, they met him when they were 17, and now they're 25, they're with the same guy. I have some girls working for me who- So, are, so they basically, they're in a relationship. Yeah, and it's just money. Pure work. It's just money. It's just work, right? It's just, no guy touches them. It's mm -hmm. all digitalized. It's all just pixels on a screen. Obviously, you have the odd girl who's a complete hoe and she'll be a cam girl and also a prostitute and stuff. But if you can make thirty, forty thousand dollars a month from a computer, why would you go be a hooker? Why mm -hmm. would you get up and get dressed and go out there? Like, why would you even do that? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these girls are a lot more pure than men will give them credit for. Them. This is fascinating to me because uh, I think that people look at it the exact same. Yeah. Right. Most of like the general public, if they hear you talking about webcam uh, girls and like this whole business, et cetera, they immediately like, oh, that's prostitution. Yeah. But it, it um, coming from like a technology standpoint, not having thought a lot about this before, uh, there's a very interesting world where you start to think about like, OK, if it's a real person, then there's ethical concerns. What happens if all of a sudden it's just literally a avatar? Yep. Right. And it just looks really, really real. And, and that's starting to happen now. Oh, really? Yeah, we're starting to get okay. like, there's a, a couple of accounts on some of these webcam things and it's like a, a Barbie and it is a girl controlling it, the Barbie, but she like controls Barbie. She has a personality for real? the Barbie. No, literally it's a Barbie doll. Oh. And she's like controlling the Barbie as a personality for the Barbie. That's and a little like, weird. It's, it's, it's weird. But the world, <laughs> but hey, the world, is, the world is weird. But yeah, my yeah. point is I didn't have ethical concerns because the girls, no one exploited the girls. I made girls rich. I didn't exploit women. Are, are there uh, female bosses in any of these organizations? Uh, I, you do have, so you do usually have like a girl boss, okay. which is usually the best cam girl. Okay. So you do have a girl boss, but there always has to be a man at the top. There's Why? never, there, because women won't give their money to a woman. What do you mean? Uh, if you had a woman who was in charge of a bunch of women, all the women at the bottom would look up and say, why is she not on cam? Why am I not, why am I giving her my money? Whereas a man, they can go, ah, but he's, he's the man. If they truly respect you, they understand that you know things they don't know. Basic things, my friend, basic so, things. So no, no woman's ever run one of these organizations? I don't know, maybe, but I never met one. Every man yeah. I know who was doing this was a man. And the women liked it. Even if, the, even if he wasn't sleeping with all the girls. I should get one of them to come in here and do an interview and explain this. Absolutely. But yeah. um, even, even, if, even if you're not sleeping with all your girls, you're obviously sleeping with some, whatever. But you have to be a... <laughs> Wait, hold on. You can't say that offhand comment. Just keep going. I like 65% of them. But 65% um, of the people who worked for you, yeah. you're sleeping with. Well, they wanted to. I mean, if, they, if a woman respects you enough to work for you, then she respects you. Like every, it's like the old adage of the woman at the office liking her boss, right? You're her boss. She's naked in your house. You've made her millions and millions. You got a Lambo out front. You're the big G. Like, what you, what's gonna like? Come on. So can can I uh, put this forward? One of the things I think a lot about uh, over the last twelve months or so okay. is there's a lot of things that happen in the United States that are completely seen as uh, offensive, exploitative, yep. uh, incorrect, politically incorrect. The, the whole nine yards. Yep. Other countries. It's actually way worse. Yeah. So, for example, uh, the United States, there's a lot of people who get very, very upset, uh, some for right reasons, some for not, yeah. about racism in America. Yeah. Right. And 
the way that I kind of think about it is like racism exists all over the world. Correct. Right. And uh, we should do everything we can to not have racism Correct. exist. Right. Uh, and on top of that, there are certain situations where it's more likely to happen than not. Correct. Right. And so if we can identify that stuff, then like let's address the real problems and yeah. not screw around kind of crying wolf when there, it's not real. Correct. Now, I say all of that as like I think that most people when they look at a problem like racism, they come at it from a genuine Hey, we should solve this. Yeah. Right. There's other countries in the world where this isn't not only is not a conversation, it is a thousand times worse. Go anywhere in Asia. Well, and, and by the way, that doesn't make it okay. But it's just States. the reality of the world, right? It, it's just the the relative component of this is very fascinating because it's much more of a conversation in the United States than it is in many other countries Correct. as well. And so what you start to really kind of peel apart here is the conversation is important in the United States, right? And we should solve the problem. But these other countries are actually, whether it's racism or other types of issues that the United States now is kind yep. of de- facing, it's actually really antiquated in some ways. Completely agree. Right? And so you've spent, what, the last, how many years in Romania? Five years. Okay. And then before that, lived most of your life all throughout Europe. Yeah. Right? How much worse off is the United States versus these countries and vice versa? That's a really good question. But you've just nailed it because in some countries, the conversation really isn't a conversation. Like I live in Romania now, right? I'm not a Romanian. I live in Romania. Now, the, I think it, in the last census, it was 99.7% of people inside of Romania are ethnic Romanian. Like 99.7. Okay. So it's, nobody goes there really. And uh, it is, you do get some interesting observations. I was Bucharest, the capital city. People always say to me, hey, Tate, are you okay, okay over there? There's mafia and stuff. And I say, look, you live in London. Don't worry about me. I'm, I'm fine. Bucharest, the capital city, is extremely safe. Really? It's extremely safe. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, there's mafia. But the mafia boys are not interested in your wallet. Like, they, the, the chance of random violence is statistically zero. If you have a big mouth and make big enemies, you're going to go missing, right? But that's the same nearly anywhere in the world. If you're going to run around running your mouth, you can do that here in Miami. You'll get in trouble. Right. Yep. If you show people respect, the odds of random violence in, in Romania is basically zero. And, and just so we're clear, as we go through this conversation, you're half black, half white, half black, half white. All right. right. And uh, going to a place like Romania, yeah, 100 percent white, 99 percent white. Yeah, 99 percent white. Okay. It's, it's 99 percent white. Everyone's white. And um, so in a good case, people just think you're tan. Yeah, they think I'm tan. <laughs> but even even some of my friends who came to visit me who are black, they don't really have a problem with it. But mm-hmm. we're never going to be seen as Romanians. Uh, that, that's my point. It's more so, it, it's just very obvious because the country is so homogeneous in yeah. terms of the skin color. Yeah, okay. we're never yeah. going to be seen as Romanians. And I it would be insulting for me to try and be a Romanian. This is what's kind of unique because in America, you can turn up here, you can look Japanese, you can be from Japan. But if you speak fluent English without an accent, you're American, right? Mm-hmm. But you can go to Japan and, and speak- And that is a- um, a very aspirational thing yeah. and uh, heavily encouraged by the country yep. and not seen as uh, a negative. It's actually seen as a positive. Hey, yep. we, we want people to come here completely th- that are uh, contributing to society that are completely. smart. We want them to become Americans, the American dream, all that stuff. Yeah. Basically what you're saying is other countries, that's not true. Absolutely not. You can go to Japan and speak fluent Japanese without an accent. Be perfect. You don't look Japanese. You are not Japanese and you will never be Japanese. You'll never be treated like a Japanese and man and the man, every man out there does not want his daughter with you because you're not Japanese. It's the same thing in Romania to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. I was in a taxi and it was three in the morning and these two girls were walking. We were in the taxi and they were walking through the park. And I said, I still find it very strange that girls walk alone at night here everywhere. And there's no problems. And the taxi driver said to me, yes, but they're Romanian girls. A Romanian wouldn't hurt a Romanian girl. As in, it's mm. like, why would someone hurt her? Because we're all Romanians. That's completely gone from the West. So that was like <laughs> mind boggling to me. But then also, if the police stop me or something, I am treated with additional suspicion. Mm-hmm. Oh, especially because I have a nice car, right? I've, I, well, I have 17 nice cars. Don't want to brag. But when I, <laughs> I have 17 supercars. But um, if I get stopped in the Lambo or the Ferrari at night and they, they come up and they have, it's a foreign plate, it's a British plated car, and they come up and they find out I'm American, they are more, they do call for backup. It, they are very sketchy. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it because you're American, because you're half black, or because of the car? Or I think it's a combination of, of everything. All three. But okay. I've been in the car with my Romanian friends when the police stopped them, and it's far more relaxed. It's far more like, hey, you were speeding. Oh, no. And they're like, yeah, I was speeding. And they're not angry. Like, it's kind of interesting as well, because an American cop, if you speed, will be genuinely mad at you for breaking the law. Whereas a Romanian cop will be more like, we all do it, but I got you. Ha ha ha. And they all laugh and have a joke. And then you pay a bribe and it goes away. It's like, it's very much more chilled. But when I get stopped, it's not chilled. I'm would, not a Romanian. Would American cops be more chill if they got the bribe? <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But then, but then also no one runs from the police. Police never get shot. 
Like it's yeah. just a different environment completely. Like yeah. there's the, there's never been, I think the police have killed one person in like 22 years or something like no one. It's just a different environment. It's really, really safe place overall. So it's kind of cool from that perspective. And you're right. All the, but the way I'm treated in Romania in America, if I was treated that way in America, I'd be kicking off and I was just racist, but they're, they're racist. They are racist. But I just think, you know, I'm but, on their it, turf it, and it, I respect it. So it's like, it is what it, it is. It kind of almost sounds like, uh, it's accepted and therefore nobody argues about it. Whereas in the United States, right? Uh, the expectation is that ra no racism is the default, right? Yeah. Whereas there it almost feels like racism is the default. Well, the thing is you have to recognize about racism. I'm saying this as a half black, half white person, right? I think we often confuse racism with pattern recognition. And I know this sounds bad, but it's true. If I walk down the street and a purple man attacks me, and then I walk down the street again, and a purple man attacks me. The, the Two years later, when I'm walking down the street and I see a purple man, I'm going to be more intimidated than if it was a green man, for example. That's pattern recognition. This is how humans learn to not go stroke lions. Because remember, hey, remember that guy stroke the lion and ripped his head off? I'm not going to do that anymore. That's pattern recognition, right? So we also have to address the fact that certain people in certain positions are going to unfortunately have a bias towards certain things because of a pattern they've recognized. That's not racism, right? So I understand that the Romanian police, for a while, they had problems with Russians and a few other nationalities. Anyone who wasn't Romanian was seen as a criminal. And they, and I'm turning up in a super fast car. I'm not Romanian. They, they're going to want to get me out my car, search my car, get the drug dogs. Da -da, because that's just the pattern they've recognized. The biggest problems and the biggest busts they've ever had have been non-ethnic Romanians. So I just respect it. I'm not going to sit there and let it bother me. Do, I, they, do they give you a hard time? Uh, they give me a semi hard time, but I'm also super friendly. I know how to get through life. This is another thing that people don't understand about racism. I'm telling you now, uh, people who say America's racist, blah, blah, blah. Fine. You could get the probably the most racist cop in America. And, uh, and I'm not going to say all the cops are perfect because I've seen them do some dumb stuff. Of course I have. But in general, I like to believe that if you show someone respect, 99% of the time they show you respect back, regardless of what color they are. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When the police stop me, I just show absolute respect. I'm just like, oh, I love Romania. I'm so thank you for letting me be here. And after like 10 seconds, I'm like, oh, okay, it's cool. But like, if I was getting out like, hey, why are you stopping me? You're stopping me because I'm foreign. Da -da -da, I'm a big dude. Now they're going to be getting their hand on the go. Like, why? It was just stupid. I don't know. I think a lot of people make a lot of stupid decisions out here. But yeah, in terms of racism, America is absolutely not the most racist country in the world. If you travel like I have, I've been to 72 countries. Basically, every country is more racist than America. I was in Iraq. Long story. I was in Iraq. They're all racist against each other for tribe or for last name. Where'd you all, go? I was in Iraq. I was in Baghdad about mm -hmm. three years ago. There was a, a member of parliament wanting to become the sports minister. And to become sports minister, he wanted to fill a stadium and have a kickboxing fight in front of everyone, but he didn't want to lose, so he fixed it. And because he fixed it, he wanted legitimate world champions to come to give it credibility, and he wanted me to give a speech afterwards. And he paid me a bunch of money and got me a, a government pass and a private jet from Romania to go to Iraq. And I'm kind of like, is this stadium going to just blow up? You know when you're in Iraq and you're like in the stadium, me and Tristan are down on the grass, like far away from the bleachers. We're just like... Oh man. But, but even to, I, to almost anyone else in the world, it'd be like, you know, when you're in Iraq, that'd be a weird thing to say, but yes, I do know what it's like to be in Iraq. So. Yeah, okay. So, you know, so, you know, right. So yeah. And, and, uh, so I've been all over the world and, and there's racism absolutely everywhere. Africa's completely racist. They're all racist. For Hutu, Tutu, look, look up your history. They were at war with each other for basically no reason. Humans are tribalistic, right? And the number one way you're going to destroy racism, if you really want to destroy it, is to stop talking about it. Stop discussing it. You think that's a solution? I think it's the beginning of a solution. Okay. I think if we just look at police brutality as opposed to police brutality versus white, black, Asian, let's look at a police brutality. Right now we have this stop Asian hate thing going on. And yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Okay, stop Asian hate. Because you see some Asian person get beat up and it's on the internet. That, uh, I'm, I guarantee yesterday when that Asian person got beat up, a black guy got his ass whooped and a white guy got his ass whooped just the same. People get ass whoopings. Like, why do we have to put a race on the ass whooping? Stop ass whoopings. St why, why add a race in? Mm -hmm. Stop police brutality. Why add a race in? Why are we adding race to everything? If, if all you look for is the same thing and you add a race taint to everything, then you're going to see racism. That's how it works. That's how the world works. It's like when you buy a Lambo and you, you thought you never saw a Lambo before. Now you see him everywhere and you're mad because you thought you were special and you're not. It's the same thing. If all you look for and all you talk about is the same thing, you're going to identify it, right? So we need to stop all police brutality against all people, even against sexy caramel kickboxing world champions. Leave me alone. That's how this is how the world needs to be. But it's too, it's just, just fixation on race and to tie into maybe the Bitcoin argument a little bit. But I truly believe this is propagated by the ruling elites on purpose. Why? They, because 
When a black billionaire meets a white billionaire, do you think there's any racism? Do you think they care? Of course, he's a billionaire. I'm a billionaire. Both our yachts are in Monaco. He's from Algeria. He stole all the gold. I'm a stock market, whatever. There's no racism. The racism's for the poor people. Because if you keep the poor people divided, they can't wake up long enough to do what I did and read about how money works. Because if they do that, we're in big trouble, right? <laughs> then the slaves will wake up. You don't want to deprogram the slaves. So you have to convince the slaves that it's not the monetary system's fault that you're broke. It's not the monetary system's fault that you continue to work for a set number of dollars and the price of houses just keep going up and up and up. It's not the monetary system's fault. It's the white man's fault or the black man's fault or the Asian people's fault. Someone else's fault. Because if the poor people all fight each other, they can't wake up long enough to look up and go, ah, oh, there's not actually that many of them. Ah, okay. Mm. You know, and we can change things. And this is what's crazy about it. I think all this stuff, feminism, racism, all these things, I think they're all control mechanisms. They have to keep the poor people fighting amongst each other. Because if the poor people all unite, then it's much harder to control us. That's all I really truly believe is happening. I believe we live in a world now where the people who are truly in charge of the world are scrambling, trying to find new mechanisms to control people. They're scrambling because the internet has allowed us to think for ourselves. The old mechanisms of controlling people, the old propaganda machine, like the Vietnam War. Oh, tell them they took one of our boats, put it on the news. Now we can go send young men to die in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam. You got, I'm military aged. Now when I go to Vietnam, we're all happy and smiles, right? Four years ago, they'd be shooting me. Like all those people died there for what? It's stupid. The whole thing is stupid. And they lied on the news about why we even went there. But now that we have the internet and now people can look and fact check things themselves to like, oh, okay, well, our propaganda mechanisms, they still work. Corona's proved a lot of that. They still work, but it's getting harder and harder. So we need to distract the people. We need to distract them. Did you know all the police are racist? All of them. Every single police officer is racist. You know, they're going to kill you for no reason. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a control mechanism. Who, who do you think is in charge of the world? You want me to go Alex Jones? On a level of one to 10, how Alex Jones do you want me to go? No, I want you to tell me what you think. Like, like if you had to say, uh, all right, there's all of this uh, kind of coordination to yeah. some degree that's happening yeah. uh, specifically around mainstream media, yep. uh, around the narratives that are created yep. and they're done with a specific purpose in mind. Yep. Who are the people who are planning that or, uh, or, or trying to coordinate all this? Okay. So I don't think it's like dark room. Oh, it is actually kind of like this, but I don't want people to imagine I'm thinking as like dark room dudes sitting around making plans. It's kind of like that, but it's just, you know, dinner clubs and golf clubs, et cetera. What I truly- so not dark rooms, lighted rooms. Light, lit rooms. Yeah, lit, lit, very fancy, nice rooms. No, but what I truly believe it is, is that every single human on earth tries their very best to propagate their worldview. For the same reason we're doing this podcast, we're trying to explain to people how we think based on our own experiences and how we think the world should be, right? So if you have a worldview and you try your best to propagate it, the more powerful you are, the more influence you have over people, the more likely you are to influence your worldview. It's the same with any company, right? When you walk into your company at work, you want to say, look, do this, do this, do this, and people obey. You don't want to say, do this, do this, do this, and people disobey. So if you're a very, very important person and you're in charge of things and you control, I don't know, all the food in a country, you don't want a minister that's going to give you trouble. Why would you want members of parliament to give you trouble? This is your country. You basically own all the land. So you want a minister who's going to say, yes, sir, no, sir. It's your company. So the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to appoint people that enforce your worldview. And there's certain people in the world today that have so much influence. I don't even think they necessarily believe they're doing anything evil, but they think and view the world a certain way. And they use all of their political leverage, all of their friendships and all their financial leverage to try and point their, the world in the direction they want it to go. And that's exactly what's happening. These are the people who control the world. The people who control everything. They control everything. They control the news. They decided, I'm not even going to give my political views, but the people who own the news channels decided it was better if Trump wasn't in the White House. They thought, you know what? He doesn't listen to us. And I think I know best. And I want a president who's senile and will sign anything we give him. So let's, let's get rid of Trump. Let's get sleepy Joe. And let's do whatever it takes to put our guy there. So when I give him a page of legislation, 50 pages long, he doesn't even read it. He just signs it. Trump, he read it. Can't stand that guy. I ain't got time for him. I'm trying to save the world. I'm a good person. I know what's best. You, my family's been in charge forever. I know what the good things for the world are. And that's all that's really happening. People are really trying to force their worldviews. And these people have huge influence. Do you think that it's just the media or do you think it's technology companies? I think it's everything. You, but, but how can it be everything? Because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. These people have so much control, so much power. They decide. They decide truth at this point. It's not about truth is subjective. 
true false doesn't exist, right? If everyone in the world were to simultaneously agree that two plus two equals five, then two plus two now equals five. It doesn't matter if math doesn't work anymore. The whole world believes two plus two equals five. That's now true. If they control what people see and control how people think, then they control what's true and what's false. Trump is racist because they said he's racist. He hasn't done anything racist, but they said he's racist to the point where Trump's now a racist. That's now true. These people now can literally bend reality in real time. Let me ask you a question. If there was a basketball game between some random people in the street, let's say we were to go out there and get five people for each side basketball game and tell them the winner was going to get $10,000 and there was no referee. Do you think that somebody might try and cheat a little bit? Uh, I think I would expect them to cheat. Exactly. <laughs> so if people out on the street will cheat for $10,000. You're telling me the people in charge of the world aren't going to cheat to, con to keep control? They're not going to lie? They're not going to trick the general populace to keep us all as slaves? We're talking about cheating over a little basketball game. You're talking about they're not going to cheat an election? Do you think to, to control the free world? Of course they'll cheat. This is humans. We'll all cheat. This is the exact point. These people in charge of all this stuff, all they've ever done is cheat. Why would they play by the rules? You can't risk losing. Do you, do you think that uh, every election in every country is rigged? So this is a really good question. So after the U.S. election was rigged, which it was, after they rigged the U.S. Well, election. Why do you say that? I, I say that because all the empirical evidence points to the fact it was rigged. Like? Like the fact that it's the longest count in history. Like you can see the spike, the spike of votes just appearing out of nowhere, popping up. All the boxes of votes appearing from the sky. The, all the evidence. If you actually look at the evidence of the election, it doesn't make statistical sense. None of it adds up. There's no way, there's no way Joe won that. I'll tell you another reason I know it's rigged. I know it's rigged because Judge Judy, a good friend, no, she's not a good friend of mine, <laughs> but I love Judge Judy. She has a saying, Judge Judy has a saying, if it doesn't make sense, it isn't true. Hillary was supposed to beat Trump. Everyone knew Hillary was supposed to beat Trump. Hillary, they put all over the news. She has a 99% chance of winning. She had all the support from the media companies, all the support from the political elite. She's supposed to beat Trump. Trump won. The political elite and the elites behind things start panicking. Just like I said, oh no, we no longer control everything from the shadows because the president won't listen. We used to have presidents who obeyed the shadow figures. Trump won't obey the shadow figures. So they invent Russian collusion. They spend years inventing Russian collusion, trying to get rid of him. All they do is try and get rid of him. And I sat there with my brother and when, when Biden won the democratic election, I said, this election's rigged. I said it before the election. Tristan goes, why? I said, do you think people who have spent the last four years inventing charges trying to get rid of Trump are going to put up Sleepy Joe and let him get landslided? Do you think they're that stupid? If, if Trump beat Hillary, they, they, you think the people in charge of the world really believe Sleepy Joe's going to do it? He didn't even campaign the whole time because they all knew it was in the bag. They said to Joe, don't worry, my friend. It's in the bag. Don't worry about it. Take a nap. We got it. We got it. They rigged it from the start. So, of course, it was absolutely not really rigged. It was rigged. And what's interesting is about three months ago, there was a military coup in Myanmar. Do you know that? So three months ago, there's a military coup in Myanmar. I saw this on the news. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I looked into it a bit. And the reason the military took over is because they said the elections were rigged. I was like, OK. And I looked into it a little bit further. The two, the two political parties in Myanmar were around 51 percent, 49 percent back and forth for a while until the 90s, when one political party became very good friends with the Clintons. Since then, they've won every single year by a huge margin. And the military is now taking the country back, saying all the elections are rigged. No one's voting for these people, and they keep winning. Do you know what voting machines they use? Which one? The same as the United States. <laughs> so now I realize the whole thing. Now, every, now I know it's all fake. It's all fake. All so of it's fake now. How, how does that explain somebody like Trump, then? Explain somebody like Trump, because Trump was the first time they used their— this, Trump was the wake-up call for these people. Their traditional methods of control, the propaganda machine— failed them for the first time in human history. And, they, and then it became, now it's become scramble panic stations, right? Usually it's put all over the news, scare the people, it'll be fine. Up until that point, every single war, Gulf War, Vietnam War, it always worked out, right? The first time ever, Trump's bad, Trump's racist, he grabs girls by the pussy, Hillary's the person you want, there's a 99% chance of winning, don't waste your vote, Trump's gonna lose, Trump's gonna lose, Trump's gonna lose. And Trump won, they couldn't believe it. Why do you think he won? I think he won because I actually thought until Corona, that there were people out there in the world with half a brain. And I think people were tired of the political elite. Nobody wants Biden. Go down the street. You say, do you want Biden or you just not like Trump? And if they're programmed to go, oh, well I, well, I didn't like Trump. But no one's like, yes, Joe Biden. Nobody, nobody wants him. His, his, his rallies were empty. Nobody wanted him. Right? So after the propaganda machine failed them for the first time, they started going, okay, well, now what do we do? Our propaganda machine doesn't work. So we have to do two things. First, we have to fix our propaganda machine and get strict with censorship and fact checkers. 
We have to fix our propaganda machines. The first thing we have to do. Second thing we need to do is just rig this because we ain't losing twice in a row. No way. Four years I haven't had absolute control over the world. And it's an ego trip. My entire life, my, my family since the dawn of human time, since the beginning of the monetary system have controlled everything ever. You're gonna tell me there's a four year period where I couldn't snap my fingers and get what I want? This is unacceptable. You don't know who I am. Fix this, rig it. I don't care what it takes. What are the people gonna do? What's amazing is the people who are in charge of the world now, they're doing stuff in broad daylight. They'll kill, Ep they'll kill Epstein in front of us all. And they realize the people aren't doing anything. They've got us so divided at a lower level that we don't unite behind anything. So now they don't have to hide things. They used to have to hide their crimes, right? Now they're just like, Epstein's in jail. They're sitting around the table. Well, oh, Epstein might talk. Da -da -da. Well, we can't kill him. People will know. Who cares if they know? Just kill him. Okay, boom, boom. Everyone makes a few memes. End of story. So now they don't have to hide what they do anymore. So everyone knows the election's rigged. They didn't even try and hide it. Mail-in voting, we're gonna take an extra 10 days to count and uh, bu buses of votes come out of nowhere and it's all fair, get over it. They don't even hide what they're doing anymore. Do you think the president matters? No. Who the president is? Well, I think Trump mattered because he was the last bastion of resistance to the shadow figures who truly run the world. I think now, from here on out, it's never gonna matter because whoever's in there is in there because he has people above him who he complies with. That, that's what I believe. I believe Trump was the last hope of a president who actually had ideas and actually cared. Putin said this. Have you seen the clip of Putin? Putin said this in an interview. They said, what do you think of Trump? And he said, I've been through three United States presidents. You can Google this yourself, gentlemen. He said, I've been through three U.S. presidents and they all have amazing ideas. But the ideas don't get implemented because people don't understand how strong the bureaucracy of America is. When the people with the dark suits arrive and explain to him how things are really done, his ideas will not come to fruition. Putin said himself, the president has people above him telling him what to do. Putin knows it. Everyone knows it, right? Trump's the first guy who said, no, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And they just attacked him with their propaganda machine. A nonstop onslaught of attack to, to program and brainwash people. And on top of that, they still rigged it because he was still winning. That's what's really happening in the world today. When you look at things like Corona and all these other things, it's all an attack on the freedom of individuals because the people in charge of the world now understand that they can no longer control us by our propaganda and they have to remove our freedoms. And to remove our freedoms, there's only one thing you can remove. You can only remove freedom and replace it with one thing humans will accept, and that's safety. You won't be free anymore, but you'll be safe. I promise. Give me all your freedom. You don't need to own anything. Give it all to me, but I'll keep you safe. Oh, it's the whole idea of the government's coming to save you. It's the only thing that stupid people will accept. And that's why in real time, we see our freedoms evaporate in real time, day by day. And we're too busy arguing about racism to do anything about it. Whole thing's crazy. What, what do you think is the biggest freedom that's evaporated over the last 12 months? Well, in the last 12 months, we've lost our freedom to leave our house. We've lost our freedom to not muzzle our own face. A mask is a big deal to me. You can't tell me what to put on my face. It's my face. We're soon, the, soon the vaccine's going to be mandated. That's a huge deal to me. Do I believe that vaccine's actually going to hurt me? No, I'm strong. I'm Iron Man. No, but I should have some sovereignty over my own blood. You're telling me I don't get to choose what's in my bloodstream? The government owns me to that level like a sheep in a farm where I can't even decide amongst myself. I can't make a personal decision to keep my blood pure of your experimental vaccines. This is insane. We've lost freedom on every level. And what they do when they take your freedom is they take a bunch of it then they give half of it back and say, we're back to normal. And people go, yay, back to normal. Now I only need an extra vaccine passport and I can go on holiday. We're not back to normal. A year and a half ago, we could do whatever we wanted. Nothing's back to normal. And it's never going to go back to normal until people stop complying. So what's the solution? The solu like, like for the individual person who's sitting there saying everything you're saying, I agree with, uh, what do they do? And that's a good question. But really, Corona, I had very little faith in humanity and Corona, Corona sealed the deal, man. Corona sealed the deal. I could not believe the level to which people were complying with this garbage. I, I really couldn't believe. You're, you're telling, you're forcing people to close down family businesses they've had for generations. You're putting people out, of, you're bankrupting people. Like all over a virus that they will openly tell you won't hurt you, 99.9% .9 survival rate. And people are still complying. I couldn't believe it. I really, I was sitting there in real time like this is remarkable. I was in Romania and Romania is part of the EU and EU is all shadow figures. Do you know who's in charge of the European Union? I do not. Nobody does. That's the exact point. They have a parliament. The parliament can discuss law, but it cannot repeal law or make law. The laws are proposed by a committee. Who's on the committee? Nobody knows. Are they elected? No. Really? Yeah, Google it. So Romania, even though the Romanian politicians and I have very, I have very high friends in Romania and I have casinos in Romania, which I've been trying to reopen. 
So I've had meetings with high-level Romanian politicians offering them bribes, and they've sat there and said, we know Corona's bullshit, but the EU is giving us relief funds, billions and billions, we have to comply, we have to make lockdowns. We're all sitting there with no masks. Everyone knows, shadow figures are in charge of all this junk, right? When this kicked off, me and my brother went to Sweden for two months. It's all over my Twitter, all over my Instagram. I tried to inspire rebellion because Sweden, for somehow, because the Swedes are pussies, I don't know how they pulled this off. Sweden and Belarus were the only two countries in the world that didn't enact lockdowns. For two months, I was running around Sweden in nightclubs with beautiful women. Two solid months, no masks, no lockdowns, no restrictions. This is the, at the height of the craziness, March last year. And everyone's watching what I'm doing and going, oh, Tate's crazy. I'm like, no, you're crazy for not doing what, can't you see, it's fine. I've taken the risk for you. You've watched me for two months. I'm fine. All these chicks are fine. The woman in my bed who I just woke up with is fine. It's all fine. What are you panicking for? And then they'll go, oh no, I know someone who died. My friend's 98-year-old grandma died. Oh, 98-year-olds never used to die before Corona. Oh, that's your proof. That, that this is in the bag there. I didn't know that. She was going to live forever. Old fucking grandma Janelle. People die. It's just insane. They have destroyed the lives of young, healthy people and destroyed economies under the guise of that they're saving lives when the average age of death of Corona is higher than the average life expectancy. It's incredible. And people to this day still put their masks on. You must have a mental disorder to be putting a mask on. And when you ask me what do people do on the individual level, if everyone did what I did, it would be over in a week. I'm not even saying get arrested. I'm not saying refuse to put a mask on. All I'm saying is, don't put it on unless you're asked. Imagine you're a security guard and every single person who walks in has no mask. Excuse me, excuse me, please don't mask on. Please don't, I ain't got one. Have you got one for me? Oh, uh, okay. And it runs off, gets your mask on. Thanks. Next person. Excuse me, excuse me. How long are they gonna fucking, two hours? And they'll be like, oh. They'll give up. And now they've given up, that's over, right? But everyone's such behaved little children. Let me put a mask on first. I, I'll put a mask on sometimes, but I'll, I'll make it hard. I'll walk in, excuse me, excuse me, I'll ignore them. I'll make them chase me down the aisle. Do you have a mask? No, can you give me one? Oh, uh, uh, oh, I don't have one. Well, if you don't have one, I don't have one. Look, I have to go shopping, my friend. So please, you must have a mask somewhere in the store. Make him go do a 15 minute search. Make him find one, make him bring it to him. Make him work. Don't give up. Why are you giving in slavery instantly? Make him do something. And then it'll all be over with. But everyone's just, oh, let me get my mask in advance. And what, what do you say to the people who say you should wear the mask for uh, preventing the spread of the virus? I say a few things. First things first is what's always amazing about this mask mandate. I've always questioned this amongst people. I can tell you, you really hate it. Well, I hate it because I, I, it's, it's destroyed my last faith in humanity. I understand why the Nazis or how the Nazis managed to do what they did. I understand now how the Nazis did the worst atro atrocities in human in history. Because they said, do this, do this, do this. And people don't think. People don't think. People are ignoring their own eyes. Do you see a pandemic? Are the hospitals full? Do you see people dying? Do you even know anybody who's died? Stop saying the word pandemic. You're, you're listening to the news. It's insane, right? So it does frustrate me. It really does frustrate me. So what was the original question? In terms of uh, the mask, wearing yeah, the mask. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so why is wearing a mask such a big deal, right? It would just, it, what do you say to the people who say, hey, sure, there's personal uh, freedoms and liberties, but uh, you putting the mask on prevents somebody else from getting sick? If they have their mask on, why do I need my mask on? <laughs> this is a genuine question. When the mask mandates lift, has Corona gone away? No, it's still there. Nothing's changed. Do you think that we should be back to normal? I think that if you wear a mask, it's for one of two reasons. You're scared of Corona, which is pathetic. Because there's bacteria everywhere, there's germs everywhere, and there's no way to live your life. You get sick, you get sick. That's unfortunate. That's how the world works. Being scared of corona is pathetic. Option two, you're not scared of corona, you're scared of the government. So it's option one, you're a coward because you're scared of corona. Or option two, you're not scared of corona, you just comply knowing it's stupid, making you a coward. You're either an idiot or a coward. Every time you put a mask on, you can choose which one you want to be, but you're an idiot or a coward. You wear your mask. If you're so worried about my mask, why are you screaming in my face? You're not scared of Corona. You're scared of the fact that you comply. You've sacrificed your honor as an individual and I haven't. And I annoy you by existing because I show that I have bravery and balls. This Corona thing was the first time an absolute coward got to feel powerful. I feel like a real man because I, I put three masks on and a face mask. I'm a good person. Before that, to be a real man, you had to be a firefighter or go join the army. If you wanted some honor, you had to risk your life. Now, if you want honor, you have to be the biggest cuck in the world. And for that reason, they're going to try and propagate it. 
They're going to try and propagate it. People hate seeing me win at life. For the same reason they hate seeing us win at life, they hate seeing a man without a mask. I will walk through your grocery store with no mask and I'll walk out and not catch corona. And that bothers you because you have two vaccines and three masks on. It just upsets them. When you think about uh, where the world's headed, what is the solution? Okay, that's a good question. And I can only find one solution. Okay. And this is kind of where I'm going to do a small plug. But um, I run an organization called The War Room. And the organization, All right, what is that? It's a global organization which is based around preparing for the future of that we're going to live in. All the things I was saying to do, I was saying to do pre-corona, and they've been amazing during corona. I, it's almost like I predicted corona itself. You know, when Noah built the ark, he was a crazy right-wing conspiracy theorist until it started to rain, right? Now he's not crazy anymore. And the ark was open for everybody. It wasn't just the animals who said, come get on my ark. I've got the answer. And they're like, yeah, crazy. You're crazy, bro. Till it starts to rain. If Corona isn't a little sprinkle of rain for you as an individual, then you can turn off the podcast because then there's something wrong with you, right? So I run an organization which is primarily based around living off grid is no longer possible as an individual. We all live on grid to some degree. So what I've done is I live on as many grids as possible. So I have over seven passports. I have over 15 driver's licenses. I have residencies in over 30 countries. I have, ba I have banks in 40 countries, let's say, right? So the goal being that no one government controls my life. So during this Corona lockdown, I've gone to 16 countries. So I'd go to enter the Czech Republic, for example. I'd try and give my American passport. No, your bank is a Corona. English, your bank is a Corona. Estonian, okay, you can come in. I'm the same guy. I'm the same person, right? I have Corona or I don't, but a different passport gets me in. Right, so this goes to show the only way to really try and achieve fr true freedom is firstly, you need to remove a single government's control over your life. You need to be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna go to Singapore, I have a residency there, and I have a Singaporean bank account, and I'm gonna sit there. And if anyone has a trouble with me, I'm just gonna turn my phone off and I'm gonna ignore their emails. This is where I live now. And, they don't, and they're not gonna extradite me because I'm a resident. Unless you're on Interpol's top 10 list, they're probably not gonna, what can they really do, right? The first thing you need to do is get more passports, more residencies. And it's not impossible, it's just a headache. But through ancestry, most people watching this through ancestry can be, I'm Irish, I'm this, you can do it all, right? That's the first thing. The second thing you need to do is get rich. And this is unfortunate, but it's true. It's about to be have nots and have yachts. That's the world we're about to live in. As things get polarized, as inflation continues to go through the roof, the people who own assets are gonna get wealthy beyond belief and the people who own nothing are never gonna stand a hope of ever acquiring an asset. If you're in my position like I was, the reason I traveled to 17 countries during the strictest corona lockdowns is because I had seven passports and private jets. I'll get in, I'll get in. I'll find out which passport works. I'll book a private jet. All the commercial flights are canceled. Doesn't matter to me. Boom, I land. So what do you do as an individual? You need either the war room or there's, we're a lot deeper than that. I've given the very base view, right? Or you need to get a bunch of residencies, a bunch of passports, and you need to start preparing for the future because the future is based on enslavement. That's what it's based on. It's based on removing your freedoms in the, under the guise of safety, telling you you're going to be safe, removing all your freedom as an individual to keep you believing the lies and paying taxes and being a good slave until you die. That's what they need you to do. They need you to pay taxes and die. They're not interested in anything else. And as long as you, as people start to wake up, as people start to think more freely, they're going to do more and more extreme measures to keep us in our place. And that's what's happening in real time. Corona, at the beginning, I actually believe may have been semi-genuinely intended. Oh, maybe it's a disease. Maybe it'll get out of control. After a month, from then on out, it was an experiment in control. That's all it was. After about a month, they said, no, okay, no one's really dying. Okay, how long can we keep these people in their house? Let's have a bet. You have a ruling family, I have a ruling family. Ah, uh, they'll riot after a month. No, they won't. No, they won't. You know what? Let's really, let's really push the boat. Let's let the state next door open up fully. And let's keep this state closed and pretend that a virus respects state lines. And let's see, let's, see if they, let's see if they riot then. Oh, it's been a month. Look, they're still not rioting. These people are idiots. Let's tell them to put two masks on. Why not? Let's put, let's put two on. Put two on. It's a big joke. It's a big joke to these people. And everyone's still out here complying. Well, people forget. One of my favorite things is uh, there are certain organizations that said don't wear masks and they changed. There are certain organizations that said things like put a mask on while you have sex. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that was said that in hindsight, I think people will look at and say uh, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. But at the time, it was, you know, what was said to people from an authoritative uh, but, organization. But, people, but the reason people don't think and I've analyzed this heavily during this Corona year is I'm thinking, why am I thinking about all of this and finding the obvious flaws and people are not thinking? And the reason is, is because most people are happy to be a slave and are conditioned to slavery because they live a slave's life. I'm a free man. Right. 
I worked very, very hard to get what I have. I'm not super rich, but I have more than 10, right? I've got some money. I can go where I want. I can do what I want. No one tells me what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. No one government can control me. You can block my American passport right now because of this podcast. Guarantee I get out. Guarantee, right? I, when someone tries to take my freedom away, it's a big deal. But if you're Joe Schmo and your wife yells at you and won't give you a blowjob, you work in Starbucks for basically pennies and your boss is telling you what to do all day. When someone else tells you to do something, put a mask on. It's just like, okay. You're just a slave. You're just, you've been a slave. Every aspect of your life is slavery. Every aspect of your life is semi-depressing anyway. These people are conditioned to slavery. They're conditioned to obey. So they just obey. People like me, I'm a free man. So when you try to take my freedom, it's a big deal. Most of these people have freedom they can't even use because they're too broke. So they don't care if you ban travel. They don't leave the country anyway, right? This is what's happening amongst a lot of people. And these slaves are the same people who are going to, you've seen the Matrix, right? Everyone's seen the Matrix. Morpheus says it. Most people are so inherently dependent on the system, they will fight to defend it. That's exactly what's happening now. You see the Karens yelling about masks. They are so dependent on the system, they will do the work for them. They They will die to defend the system. It's incredible. And they really believe the system cares about them. And that's why they need to wake up and learn something about everything from the ground up, from the ground up. Why are you in Miami? Good question. I'm actually in Miami for a war room event, mentioning the war room. So we got three big mansions. It was like 55 guys from... 33 countries, and we met up and we were talking a lot of things, including crypto, funnily enough. So yeah, we're talking a lot. And crypto is actually, just to go into crypto quickly, crypto has fixed a lot of the problems I'm talking about. Crypto's How? Crypto is amazing for a bunch of things. Even inflation, man. People, the inflation figure the government state, if you believe that, you, then you believe in Corona. <laughs> but that's a lie, right? It's, it's, a, it's a flat out lie. Think about how much a chocolate bar was 10 years ago. Look at the price now. It's like four or five times more expensive in England. I don't know about America, but it's crazy, right? So my, that's one of the things it does. It, it helps with the inflation aspect. Two, you can actually control and own your money. You can actually have your money, right? You don't, you, how else are you going to have it? In cash? And then you got to deal with the inflation? How difficult is it to move serious cash? I'm, I had to send, it's about four years ago, I sent $900,000 to Qatar for a completely legal reason. Why? I had to buy one to buy a property in Qatar. So I was involved in the purchasing of a property in Qatar. Do you believe the backflips, the paperwork, the legal nightmare? I swear to God, I was putting a travel list because for about a year after that, I was stopped at every airport just, just for a bank transfer, right? No problem with Bitcoin. No problem. So it fixes a whole bunch of problems, cryptocurrencies. It certainly does. And I think a lot of people who are forward thinking and believe the things I believe in, it's the only logical conclusion. What else are you going to do? Trust a bank? Will you trust them? There's, there's nothing else to do with it. I'm actually at the point where, although I, don't, I do own a, quite a lot of property, I don't want any more. And I keep getting offered nice property deals. And Tristan's like, should we buy this? It's like, no, I don't even trust the Romanian government or the Russian government. I have property in Moscow. I don't even trust the government anymore. I don't even want a property because if I piss the government off, they're just going to take it. I don't own it. They say you own it until you annoy the government, then you don't own it, right? So I don't even want property anymore. I'm going full crazy Mr. Blockchain now because it's the only time I feel like I have control over things. And we're losing control at such a rapid rate. I'm trying to stay ahead of the curve. I don't believe people saying, oh, I'll just... Buy a house and it's my little house. It's not your little house. You'll see how quickly they'll take your little house from you. Look what they've done so far. They've taken your business from you. You think they won't take your little house? People are, people are not scared enough of the right things. They're scared of Corona. They should be scared of what the government did to them in the name of Corona. That's what they should be. But people aren't logical. People aren't logical. People have low IQs. They're slaves. And they're too busy, preoccupied with racism and all this other garbage to keep them split so they can't all get together for five seconds and start thinking, wait, this is bullshit. You should run for president. Yeah, I'd probably end up would you, shot. Would you win? Would I win? They wouldn't let me win. Why? Because they'd rig it. Imagine I had, imagine I had the influence, right? Somehow, by some miracle, and I try and run for president. Saying the things I say, you think the people in charge of the world are going to let me pre- be president? I, I don't know. They would never let me be president because I have morals and integrity as an individual, and I wouldn't lock people in their houses for a year and a half for no reason. So no, the, the only people who are going to win political competitions are people with the friends in the right places. And the friends in the right places only want puppets. They don't want... For the same reason you won't hire a member of staff who's going to disagree with you every time you give an order, you're going to fire that member of staff. You're going to get a member of staff when you say, do this, this, and this. They say, okay, set up for the podcast. Okay. If you said set up for the podcast, he said, no. They just get fired, right? This is, this is how the political system works. They're not going to put anyone in power who's going to disagree with them. Why would they? So I'll, I don't stand a chance of running for president. And truthfully, I don't really have that much 
aspiration to run for president. My goals are for my war room network and for myself. I want to know that at any moment I can book a private jet, disappear to somewhere no one's ever heard of. And I have a bunch of money in a USB stick and a bunch of passports and a bunch of residencies. I like the idea of getting a passport in a country that no one's really concerned with changing my name legally in that country. So I now have a passport, which is perfectly legal, the different name on it. I like doing all this stuff. This is my way of preparing for the world conquering. Because I guarantee you, no matter what they do in the name of Corona or whatever else, you can check my Instagram stories. I'm having fun. I'm living. You can check me. I'll be in a club in Belarus surrounded by big booties. Guaranteed. I refuse to be a slave for anyone. You can tell me to stay in my house. I won't do it. In Romania, when they enacted the curfew, there was a curfew at 7 p.m. First thing I did was get in the Lambo, start driving around making Instagram stories. And all the, all the Romanian girls are hitting me up on Instagram like, oh my God, it's a curfew. How are you out? The police are going to give you a fine. I'm like, no, I find the police. They don't find me. I'm talking all this crap, right? I got like, in the one week, I got like 11,000 euro of fines. I haven't paid them. I refuse to pay them. Take me to court. That's, I'm, I'm resisting on some level. I'm doing something. If everyone did what I did, it would be over. But I'm out there on the streets and they're empty. And I said to the cop, you know, I got stopped by cops five times. Only one gave me a fine. Of the other four cops, they were reasonable enough. I said, my friend, do you have more in common with me or with the people up there in their golden palace who are making these rules? Are you rich like them? You know they're stealing money. You know this country's corrupt. The roads have holes in them. Your pension went missing. The police pension fund went missing. Do you have more in common with me as another man out here in the street or with these people in their golden gauge? They're just giving you the orders to enforce. Why can't you think for yourself? You know Corona's not real. You think Corona matters at 6.59 or 7 p.m.? Think. And four of them were like, you're right. Have fun. One, there's always one asshole. No, Corona. And these are the stupid. People are stupid. It's a miracle. It's a miracle how stupid humans are. I don't know what to say, but I've done my very best to resist this whole way through. I've done my very best. And one of the, one of the mechanisms, one of the moves I make to resist is involved in crypto. I think I put a tweet up. I don't know if you follow my Twitter or you put it up. You remember the big Bitcoin crash, $5,400 at the beginning of this Corona thing? I'm going to really, really tank. And everyone's saying, it's over, all this crap. I put a tweet up that I still retweet to this day saying, you're all pussies. Bitcoin's coming back. I think I said, I'm buying $600,000 today and you'll, we can talk when it's 8,000. I think I said that. But I turned 600 grand to like $12 million. Because I, I had cash in a bank and when everything hit the fan, the first thing I thought was, I don't want cash. I want something else. Give me an asset. Okay, well, how can I get an asset that the government can't take? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin. But what else? What's the other answer? You tell me, bro. Maybe you know something. I don't know. Is there anything else? No, look, I, I think that it's, uh, it's an interesting view for you to have because you have the United States. You've got many European countries, right? You're half white. You're half black. You've lived all over the world, yep. right? You've had success at multiple industries. And so you just have a lot of experience, yep. right? And so what it does is it gives a very different view of the world than somebody who uh, has lived in one country, who only has one type of you know industry expertise yep. uh, or experience, uh, who only has one race, like all these different things. And so when you bring that all together, uh, it is a perspective that I think in the United States is not talked about a lot, right? Yep. And there's a lot of political correctness and, and uh, uh, kind of social pressures. Yep. At the same time, in many of these other countries, right, I think that there's just a different view, frankly, right, yep. of, uh, of the, the kind of entire uh, way society is, you know, kind of tied together. Yep. And ultimately, I think most people who agree with either it's part of or all of what you just said think technology is the answer. Right. And technology is kind of the equalizer. It's yeah. the thing that allows for uh, an imbalance of power to be essentially uh, kind of handicapped at the knee. Right. And to say, look, if everyone has access to the same technology, now all of a sudden you can really kind of even the playing field. And I think that, you know, you got to be pretty uh, sick person to believe that that's not a good thing. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, even the Internet on its most base level, forget all their censorship and fact checking, et cetera. The Internet is the only reason the propaganda machine has been broken. Before mm -hmm. the internet, they put something on the news. That was it, right? They, it's the only way that the, the internet as a whole has done very well to attack the propaganda machine. There's still people who believe everything on CNN, but there's also a whole bunch of people who understand the news is fake. That's another good thing Trump did is he came out and he coined the term fake news, fake news. Before that, we're like, what do you mean the news is fake? Now everyone's kind of like, yeah, the news is half fake at least, right? So he did an amazing, he did an amazing thing, right? So well, he, it, well, the whole thing is everyone believes the news is fake. They just argue over whether it's their news or the, or the, other, or the news. other side's yeah, news, yeah, right? That's, right. That, that's the other thing is if you notice, I, I recently saw uh, there's a New York Times journalist who literally was saying, 
oh, you're uh, posting, they were saying to a venture capitalist, oh, you're posting this uh, super basically like right wing Fox News, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> and then if you go and you go and listen to the Fox News people like, oh, you're posting the super left wing yeah, New York Times, yeah, yeah, CNN, yeah, yeah. Blah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, and so it's fascinating to see that uh, essentially, quote, unquote, fake news has now become, no, it's just the the perspective that I disagree with. Yeah. And, and, and we're all living in echo chambers and, and yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer to, to a lot of this. The only answer I've ever come up with is to be very, very rich and be able to go wherever I want and, and keep myself around people who think like me. That's the only answer I've been able to come up with. It's very difficult to save the world because if you were to try and save the world now, you'd be dragging people kicking and screaming <laughs> to their own freedom. You'd have to drag people kicking and screaming to their own freedom. Take the mask off. I don't want to. You're allowed. It's fine. There's no Corona. It's fine. Look around you. Look, Florida's open. Why are you still wearing a mask in New York? You don't need to. On Florida, no one wears masks. No, Corona, Corona. You'd have to literally physically assault somebody to, to give him his freedom back. Like, I'm not that philanthropic. I, I, I really don't care that much, right? I care about me and the people close to me. And the best way to do that is, is financial, which is the first thing. And the second thing is you need to try very, very hard to be, get beyond governmental controls. And I will say this about America. The American government is the most oppressive in the world. Even for things like Bitcoin exchanges and all this stuff, they're on top of everything. Like if you have only American passport, they're the ones who are going to really stay on top of you. If you have a Romanian passport, you can sign up to any Bitcoin exchange. Any, they don't care. They're behind. These countries are behind. A lot of countries in the world are behind, but America is the most advanced country in the world. So if you have an American passport, the American tax authorities, et cetera, they're the most advanced. They're the ones who are going to hurt you the most. If you're living only with an American passport, you're living under the most oppressive regime, the number one. And it kind of amazes me because I am American and I do love Miami especially, but this is probably the only city in America I enjoy. It's the only one. I can't name another one. Don't like LA. Don't like New York. Sorry, bro. And all the, everything in between is boring. So I don't like the whole country as a whole. But it's kind of amazing to me that we're living in basically a police state, but it's the least safe police state in the world. Like D Dubai is a police state, right? Everything's monitored. It's a police state, but it's so safe and so clean. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, in Dubai, I wear a half a million dollar watch. Nobody cares. I, I wear a half million dollar watch. I don't look over my shoulder. I'm not, I'm not carrying a weapon. I just live my life. And the, the chance of something happening is zero. You never see a car broken into. It's so safe because the law has law and order. But here we have law. But we have a police state with no safety aspect at all. And the reason for that is because I don't see what binds America together anymore. We're not, we're not binded by the basic things, like on a basic evolutionary, low IQ, gorilla level, like color, language, all these things. Fine, we're not. But we're not even, we don't even love the same flag. We don't have the same ideologies. Like, what is even keeping us together now? It used to be, well, we're all different, but we all love America. Not anymore. Half the people here hate America. We hate its past, hate everything it's done. There's nothing about it. I'm talking about Romania being safe. The Romanian police drive Dacias. They're like old Soviet cars. Like they, they couldn't drive at more than 60 miles an hour, but no one runs. Like you're talking about a country, you talk about defund the police. Their police budget must be less than a week of a real American police budget. But it's, nothing bad happens because there's family, there's morals, there's respect for the country, there's respect for the flag. They don't want to litter in their own country. Like all the problems that we have can just be fixed by basic morality because people are united by one thing. I can't think what we're united by in the West anymore. What are we united by? Nothing. We're not united by the way we think. Literally nothing. All we're united by perhaps is greed. And often if you're greedy enough, then you just find a way to step on other people. So it's very difficult to find anything that's keeping America together. I, I really believe not just America, but a lot of other societies are broken on a fundamental level. And they've got a bunch of sellotape on top, which is an armed police force. And I don't know how long over the long term we can survive and how we can perform. When you have countries like China, where they're like a beehive, they all work together. All right, okay, we're more powerful now, but for how long? Have you ever seen a Chinese person working for someone who wasn't Chinese? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I've seen maybe one in my life. Really? Yeah. Well, in the technology industry, right? Okay. There's technology industry is going to be probably loads. I'll give you another example. When I was in Iraq, I was staying in the hotel. I can't remember what it's called. It's in, the, in, it's in the middle. It was bombed like three years before I was there. It's the big one. Can't remember. And I'm staying in this hotel full of Chinese. So many Chinese in Iraq. And they all had blueprints and building plans. And I said to the barman, the barman was an African guy, a black guy. I said, why'd you come to Iraq? He goes, oh, the wages are higher. I'm like, the wages are higher in Iraq? Where, the, where are you from? It's from the Ivory Coast somewhere. Anyway, he said, yeah, the Chinese are here because they have to rebuild everything. I was like, are you telling me we spent all that money blowing this place up and now the Chinese are just going to rebuild it and get paid? That's what's happening because we won't do it because of human rights, sanctions, all this crap. We just want to blow stuff up, right? 
But now they're getting paid trillions to just rebuild it all, the Chinese. And it was kind of funny. We were in a kebab store and we could hear an AK far in the distance. I mean, Tristan were like, and all the Chinese people around us didn't even bat an eyelid. They're like, they're like, they're like ants, bro. They're just like, oh, whatever. If I die, I die. Go work tomorrow. They don't even care, right? They're so united as a people and everything's done for them. And I'm not saying the Chinese government's fantastic. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm just trying to talk about on a purely competitive, from a purely competitive perspective, which country is going to be more competitive? People which are united by something or people which are completely broken and divided on every level. And I just think over the next hundred years, I don't see how America can compete. I don't see how it can compete. And then you have real problems. Because when America loses its economic prosperity, then you're going to have to revert to the things like morality, which it has none of. I'm, Romania has no economic pr prosperity, but they have morality. It's the most Christian country in the world, 99.9% .9 Orthodox Christian. I've been on dates with 27-year-old women who have to be, at 10, be home at 10 o'clock because their father said so. Like, their families stick together. They have no social welfare programs, no disabled people programs, nothing, because the family look after them. But there's no old people home. Family looks after them. All these things we have in the West, they have none of it. It's just family. Family takes care of all those problems. I've never seen in my five years in Romania a drunk girl. They drink and they have fun. You'll never see one stumbling. You'll never see one fall over. Do you know why? Because it brings shame on the family and people will talk and her father will kick her ass. So they won't do it. They have morality. They have a base level of morality, which means their police force can be run on a fraction of a budget and the country can be basically bankrupt. It's broke. It's a poor country, right? They say it's poor. There's plenty of money there. You know the wealth divide. There's plenty of Lambos over the place. But when America loses its economic prosperity, what morality are we going to fall back on? If the police force couldn't turn up to police calls, it would be over. In nearly every city in America, it's just instant purge. We no longer have morality to fall back on. And I kind of find it amazing that a lot of the conservatives, and I'm going to say this now, I pretend I'm pro-Trump. I was very disappointed in Trump as a man. He should have gone much harder. He didn't do anything. He really didn't get much done. But a lot of conservatives believe Trump's going to save us. Trump's going to save us. Well, now you've seen they're going to rig every election. You're never going to get a good president again. Now what's your hope for America? I don't know. If I had to bet on countries like I was betting on cryptos across the next 200 years, I'd be buying China coin. I would not be buying the USA coin. I just see it on the way down. That's all I see. And, and that, for that reason, is one of the reasons I don't live here. I won't buy property here. I don't see this place being livable across the next 100 years. Sorry to be pessimistic, but uh, that's how, my view. How long do you think you'll live? I'm temporarily immortal. <laughs> I've yet to die. I've not died once. I've never died in my whole life. So why do I have to believe it's going to happen? It's probability, probably going to happen, but I don't approach life that way, right? The rule one of life is do not die. That's the first rule of life. I've been in some situations in my life where I had to remind myself of rule one. No matter what it takes, do not die. How long do I think I'll live? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing, and, I, and I'm very, very conscious of this. And a lot of people don't do this, but I am absolutely conscious of this. I enjoy every day of my life. I, I really do. And I know everyone says this, but I actually do. And that doesn't mean being stupid or irresponsible. It means enjoy everything. Enjoy the sunshine through the window as you sit in traffic. I enjoy every single day I'm alive because there's a whole, I've been to a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things. You know what I'm talking about, where people would do anything to be you. And I, sometimes I look at, especially the Western world and everyone's depressed or on medication or all this crazy stuff. And I just think a bad day is coming. For all of us, right? For all of us in our future, there's 100% probability that either we're going to die or someone we love is going to die. So a bad day is coming. You will have a reason to be upset soon enough. That's a fact. Why are you doing it in advance? Like nothing, nothing's wrong today. Oh, well, you have a flat tire. Boo-hoo. Like, like people are so emotionally reactive to, to low-level stuff. I don't get that. I've never been that person. But yeah, I don't know how long I'll live, but I know that I'm going to enjoy myself every single second. And if someone tells me to stay in my house because of a virus, I'm not going to comply because <laughs> I, I ain't got time. I'm alive once. I do not have time for that. And I refuse to comply on that level. I don't know why no one else thinks like this. Everyone's just like, oh, I've got two years to waste. No problem. It's crazy. I got three questions for you that you get to ask me when to finish up. Okay, amazing. First one, what's the most important book you've ever read? You know what's interesting? I've only read two books in my whole life. Only two? In my life. I'm not a reader. Okay. I've never, I've, every single what thing. What are the two books? Every single thing I think I know, I've, I've learned through experience and conversations. I read two books because I was in a jail cell and they gave me books. So I was arrested. It was this. I was about 24. I'll tell you the story. Why not? I'm in a, in, England, the English people are the most violent people in the world. Like they conquered the entire earth. They had the largest empire in history. English people are innately violent. People think like England, oh yeah, everyone's in suits, little gentlemen, go to England. 
right? London's like stabbing capital of the world. Like it's a very violent place and the English people will fight you over nothing. There's, they're not f- friendly or polite. They're very violent, especially when they drink. I'm at a club. I bought a brand new phone. Some girl knocked the phone out my hand. I thought her show said, hey, you knocked my phone out my hand. She turns around and goes, I don't care. It's not my phone. And she started running her mouth. So I'm arguing with this girl and then her boyfriend comes over. And then her boyfriend's like, hey, what's the problem? I was like, well, she knocked my phone out my hand. I was trying to tell her, hey, you have a problem? Then his two friends come over. So now there's three of them and I'm up against the bar. And then one of them pushes me, so I smack him. Right, so I smack one, smack the other one. Two are out. The other guy grabs me. We start wrestling a bit. And while I'm wrestling with one of the guys, the girl, because she's English, starts trying to hit me. Right, so I didn't know if it was a girl or a guy. So I'm doing this. I turn and whack, and I smack her. I spark her. Right, so I end up in in a court for GBH against a female and grievous bodily harm, and I broke her jaw and all this stuff. And my defense was, I didn't know who's hitting me. I'm just getting hit. I don't know. Watch the CCTV. I don't know. But anyway, I got away with it in the end. No, not got away with it. I was innocent. They found me innocent in the end. But anyway, the point was I was in a jail cell and they gave me two books and I can't even remember one of them. And one of them was about, I'd love, this is a challenge for the podcast. Can we give the podcast a challenge? Sure. Guys, in the comments, if you can find the name of this book, I would be really, really happy. It was extremely disappointing. It was about a UN negotiator, a female who lived in New York City, who was a UN negotiator, who was fired from being a UN negotiator because she made a terrible mistake. And they talk about this terrible mistake for the first 75% of the book, even though that the UN have now come back and need her back because she's the best negotiator, but she can't be officially on the books as a negotiator because of the terrible mistake. And she's like behind the scenes trying to negotiate. And it turns out the terrible mistake was she was negotiating peace between these two tribes in Africa and then slept with the tribal leader of one of the tribes. So I'm reading this book for like seven hours. And I get to the end and I go, so you're a, a, a doctorate from New York, UN negotiator who Went to Africa to negotiate peace, ended up getting slammed by a warlord who doesn't even speak English. You're a hoe. You're just a hoe. Like, who would do that? Who would sleep with this warlord? He's killed millions. Of, he's killed people. He's a war. He's not going to be charming. Is it a true story? I don't know what it is. I, I don't know. But he's not going to be charming, is he? I can't imagine him having game. So she was a hoe and it annoyed me and I closed the book. That's the answer. That's the answer. I got annoyed by her thaltery. I thought this is disgusting. You need to go to church and repent. I won't read this book anymore. That's the only book I've ever read. All right. Second <laughs> question. <laughs> you asked, bro. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Sleep. Yeah. I used to only sleep five or six hours. Okay. Then I started sleeping on this eight sleep mattress, okay. right? Which is basically, they just make it cold as shit. Okay. When you lay on it and you sleep deeper. And now I sleep like eight, nine hours. Okay. Life changing. Okay. How much do you sleep? Firstly, I want one of these mattresses. So, okay. Okay. Please give me the link. I, I, I can intro you to, uh, to Mateo, the CEO. He'll, uh, he'll gladly give you one. Amazing. I'd love, I'd love one of these mattresses. We'll see if we can get it to Romania. So that's the first thing. I'd love one of these. How, often, how much do I sleep? Um, I think I sleep like maybe six, seven hours a day. I'm not a big sleeper. I'm definitely not a big sleeper. I, well, you know when you're a child and you don't go to bed until you're really tired? Mm-hmm. But when you're an adult, you go to bed because you know you have to do things the next day. Mm-hmm. I try and avoid that. I try and avoid the, the latter. I try and go to bed when I'm genuinely tired. I don't think, oh, tomorrow I have a busy day. Better go to bed. Loads of adults go to bed when they're not tired. It's just a certain time. I don't give myself a bedtime. Even if I have to be up again at 6 a.m. the next morning, if I'm not tired at 3 a.m., I'll just stay up. What's the worst case that happens? Tomorrow I live a life tired. Who cares? Then I get a good night's sleep the day after that. So my, my, my relationship with sleep is very good because I don't sleep until I'm actually exhausted. Even since I've been here, I mean, the two days it took me to get here, me and Tristan were drinking the whole time. We were drinking. And then we landed and we had work to do. I mean, I'm technically, I'm jet lagged. It's nine in the morning in my time or something stupid. But I don't believe, until I'm exhausted, I'm awake. And that's it. But I want one of these mattresses. I'd like one. All right. Third question. Aliens, are you a believer or non-believer? You have to be a believer. You, how can you not believe there's nothing else out there but our pathetic species? <laughs> we're losers. We're idiots. We're arguing over the color of skin. Look how pathetic that is. Imagine being an alien race. They're still arguing over the color of skin. Still, the whole space needs exploring. They still got masks on. Like, come on, like we're losers. If we are the best that the universe can produce, it's not even worth having. We're, we, we were not, there's nothing impressive about humanity. There's got to be something better than us out there where they can see beyond skin color and, 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 and masks. There's got to be. <laughs> you, could ask, be. you could ask me one question. What's the one question you have for me? What's the one thing I've said today you disagree with most? The one thing you said today that I disagree with most. I'm going to give you a better answer than that. Good. I don't think it's so much uh, one thing that you said that I disagree with most as much as it's, uh, I think that there's, truth in every single thing that you've said, yep. the way you deliver it is very bombastic, yep. right? And uh, attention grabbing, which I'm assuming is very intentional. Yep. Uh, and 
in order to be attention grabbing and and um, uh, kind of bombastic, you have to take a truth and exaggerate, right? In terms of and remove the nuance, if, if of course. And so, if there's directionally something like uh, the world would be better off if we didn't focus on um, race and instead could remove racism yeah. from uh, conversation and simply all live as humans, yeah. I think most people would generally agree with that. Yeah. When you remove all nuance from it, right? Everyone pays attention, yells and screams, and some people will say I agree with him, and some people will say I disagree with him. Yeah, yeah. And so life goes on. I like that answer. You're a very smart man. You're a very <laughs> smart man. You're a very smart man. All right. Where can we send people to find you on the internet? Right. So I'm on Twitter, but I'm on my ninth account. So how long will I last? Who nobody knows. Um, uh, for some <laughs> reason, they seem to think I provoke people. I don't know where they got this impression from. Um, so the best places to follow me are on Instagram. Uh, Cobra Tate on Instagram. You can see me flexing on the broke boys, you know, doing, <laughs> you know, you know, it's what it's all about. Right. So it's, it's a bunch of diamond watches and fancy cars and the odd bit of Corona conspiracy thrown in. And then I have the website CobraTate.com and on CobraTate.com it gives details of my war room network and where I say what I really think. We have some information and stuff on there. So CobraTate.com is the best place to find me. If you find me interesting, you're, that's where I am. Awesome. You made it through the entire interview with the sunglasses on. I appreciate you very much. I told you much. I was bringing the fire, bro. <laughs> I told you. I told All you. right. We'll do it again next time you're in Miami. Absolutely. <laughs>